Okay, maybe I could uh, get you to talk about uh, the inclusion of the Métis in the Constitution Act of 1982, you know, the whole process behind that and how, how the Métis were included and what your roles were and all of that. Well, I think, again, uh, Saskatchewan took a lead role in that. We were, uh, Trudeau had sent out a writ that he was inviting the Métis, the Indians, and the Inuit to a constitutional conference over five years, four conferences in five years, to talk, to discuss the rights of our people and to include them in the Constitution, hopefully. And at that time, uh, we were part of the Native Council of Canada. We, Saskatchewan had been in and out over the years anyway, and uh, we had, uh, because we were a very radical group and didn't like some things they were doing. But then we, uh, we, uh, we thought it over very carefully because, uh, again, Trudeau, when he did send out the writ, he said that the uh, Native Council would represent the Métis because we were part of that organization. We definitely said a flat no. We only had a couple of weeks, and at that time, of course, uh, we did have some money, and uh, DeRocher, Jimmy DeRocher said that uh, I will look and see if I can find some money so that if we do have to go to court, we will be able to fund the process. We called a big meeting in Edmonton already with that knowledge in mind. And I think we had about 500 people show up in Edmonton from across Western Canada, from Ontario West. And we sat down and we explained the situation and said we're now on the outside looking in. Even though the Métis could be included, uh, there's no guarantee. There was mm -hmm. a, not, a lot of discussion at that time with, uh, about the Métis being inclusive in the Constitution. And there was a, there was a feeling that uh, we wanted to make sure we secured our position. So we said we would then, uh, what would be our options? And one of them was to take the Prime Minister to court for excluding us. And that was discussed at uh, the meeting in, uh, in Edmonton. And as I said before, that uh, I was chosen to do that. I was asked to do that uh, by the people that was there. I think Harry Daniels was there, there was others that was there, and uh, some of the other leaders, all the Métis leaders were there from across Canada. Did, the, pres did the Prime Minister, though, say, well, the, you know, the, the Native Council of Canada is representing you? He did. They called the three organizations. And they, but he, their impression was is that the Métis would have a voice within that organization, but would you have. disagreed with that, is that what you're saying? They would have a voice, but they, because we were not, I was not the president, uh, Smokey Breer at that time was the president, that he would speak on our behalf. And we said no, because Smokey was an Indian. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Bill Wilson was there as well mm -hmm. from BC. And Bill Wilson said, mm -hmm. we will get our rights first as Indians. We will fight for the Métis later. And there mm -hmm. was no deal. So that certainly caused us a problem. And then when we agreed, we would, uh, we would, we would uh, call this big meeting in Edmonton. Of course, like I said, we had some, some discussions back and forth. And one of them was the Manitoba raised the issue of myself being an Indian and, uh, you know, should I represent the Métis or should I not? And, uh, of course, the question came up of what if uh, I had f I failed? And they said, well, if you failed, it's, uh, an Indian doesn't really speak for us anyway. We'd, we have our own spokespeople. And if uh, we got lucky and uh, were included, then it's just an incident in history. So it was covered in some ways by some of the leadership who were a little bit afraid. Of, of doing this because we were radical and some of the other groups are not as radical as us, of course, and didn't want to be. And uh, so we, I was picked to do that and of course DeRocher was very, very, uh, <laughs> wanted to spend our money so he volunteered that he would pay the bill. And hopefully when we set up a national organization for the Métis that we'd get paid back. So it was a gamble. and. Uh, we made that commitment we, and based on that we went to work. So we went back to Saskatchewan, got our case ready. We had uh, stayed up for two nights. We had to because it's just becoming, it's going to be only two weeks away. We had uh, Rob Millen was our key lawyer. We had John Weinstein, which is a consultant of ours that worked very close with us. And uh, we got our stuff put together and we took it to a Saskatchewan court. Saskatchewan court said, no, Mr. Trudeau works in Ontario, so you'll have to go there. We then went, proceeded to go to Ontario where we presented it to three judges because that's, so we had to go to that higher court in order to make things happen prior to the constitutional process or it would have to stop, the constitutional had to be halted. 
And at that time, uh, the three judges were appointed by Trudeau them, himself, so they were reluctant to go to court, of course. But during that process of the, the week, or, week we had, I think, to get there or so, that we had uh, meetings steadily on a day-to-day -day basis with Justice Minister Mark McGuigan at that mm. particular time and the Deputy Prime Minister and other people in order to get us into the Constitution or get us at least somehow to the talks in a way we could speak. To the, even to we were offered some time by the Native Council of Canada to, to speak for ourselves, which again, you know, <laughs> we wouldn't go for. And as a result of that, uh, we, we had some huge arguments, of course, with the Justice Minister, but the, 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 when the court was to start, and we got into court to proceed with the court proceedings. Uh, every time I would get into the court to sit down for these three judges to start the court operations or the court procedures, uh, they wouldn't open the courts. They would, they would go back and the justice minister would call me. These guys, or Jimmy was out in the hall, the other guys would come and tell me this is what he's offering and I'd speak to them and they'd say no. And of course we had international TV there. We had ABC was there. I think CNN was just coming into being that time. We had uh, yeah. all the big news medias there from all across the United States and some of the world people were there, international news. So it was a big, it was a big issue. And uh, one of the things I think that uh, was, was uh, of course, being negotiated is the seats at the table. And there was two seats for everybody at the table that time. I think it was two seats for, the, uh, supposed to be two seats for the Métis, two seats for the Indians, two seats for the Inuit. So it came down to the point where uh, they'd call me out of the meeting and they offered us, uh, like I say, to say some things for ourselves but to still be part of the council. We said no. Uh, another offer came back and I can't tell you because this happened over a couple of days. Each time again we were going to start the court, it wouldn't start. The Justice Minister would call us out of the room from Ottawa and have another negotiations. And it came to the point where they said, we will allow the Mr. Sinclair to sit at the table on behalf of the Métis people at the Constitutional Conferences. And the next, next year, the next conference, we will let them have two. We'll let them have the full uh, slate. And, and I went out again, and the press, of course, was there. And I said, no, uh, we're talking about the Métis being represented at the Constitutional table, and they will select who will lead them. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of myself being at the table, it's a matter of the Métis having the rightful mm -hmm. place at the table. So at the final result, they agreed to that. So the court never did start. We sat in front of the judges for a few hours, but it never did start. It just kept going back and forth. With that announcement, uh, people said they never had a larger press conference in Ottawa uh, mm -hmm. at the, at the uh, press, press club. Uh, there was, you couldn't get in there because uh, mm -hmm. there was so full of reporters and that. And of course, many of our people who at that time who were really involved in the stuff were kind of shoved to the background and some of the leaders of the Métis were in there and mm -hmm. Drosha was kind of at the background too yeah. after Why? doing all this work. Well, because it was the Métis then took over. Eh? Yeah. So, yeah. We got we, we got we accomplished our mission. <laughs> well, I think that was a brilliant strategy. When I think of it, I'd take the prime minister to court. Yeah. <laughs> you know, look what mm -hmm. happened. They, they didn't even go anywhere. Uh, you know. But you know, and that, that again, I, of course, I was at the table, the press table, because I had to be. But some of our good people were not there. Like uh, our lawyer Rob Millen, I was very disappointed about not seeing him there because he made such a struggle. Drosher. Uh, and some of our people who were very strong with us were not even, you know, there. It was taken over by sort of a new group, and, and that's fine, you know, mm -hmm. that's the way it should be. We accomplished our goals. Mm -hmm. And I think that was uh, the, real, uh, the real beginning. But again, as I said before that, uh, before we got there, we had to sit across the table as well from, uh, from uh, Ian Binney, who is now in the Supreme Court of Canada, who was the federal... Uh, person at that time cross-examining me about why we should have the, the Métis at the table and represented by Métis. And who were the Métis? Why were we not just a group with, with the rest of the leftover Indians? And, uh, and uh, of course, Mr. Breer was sitting across the table on behalf of the government, sitting beside the government, 
guy and uh, he was with them and so we had to defend ourselves and uh, the one question I was asked very clearly is uh, who are the Métis and of course I said the Métis are a phenomenon of Western Canada and uh, that's who we are and that's who we we always were uh, many of us are half-breeds now we consider it as Métis it's fine and uh, the uh, the question then came about how do you know you are Métis and what about uh, people in Eastern Canada? I said, well, when John A. Macdonald sent the troops to crush the Métis, he didn't send them to Nova Scotia, he sent them to Batoche. And that gave us a clear identity of who we were and what our struggle was about. Mm -hmm. It was a struggle about rights, it was a struggle about land, it was a struggle about self-determination. There was no question at that time about who the Métis were and where they were when they wanted to crush them. And they wanted to, you know, and they wanted to they know, they do were. away with Riel and, you know, mm -hmm. and his group and, uh, you know, Métis at that time. Mm -hmm. And that's where they were. They were in Western Canada. Mm -hmm. And that's what we made very, very clear. Mm -hmm. So was that the end of that issue or? No, uh, it wasn't really the end of it. I think, uh, I think, you know, the, 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 the whole question, I mean, I think Canada was very well aware of it. Canada had a kind of a shameful past with the Métis, very shameful past. And our identity with Batoche and the Métis people that gave their lives there were uh, so important to us and more than a symbol to us. It was a reality we could live with. It's a reality we could go and see their graves. Yeah. It's a reality they were, had relations there and relations around the mm -hmm. province that came from there. It was, the history was still there. The history was mm -hmm. there. Uh, you know, the, uh, Riel's you know, sister the, was buried in, in Isla, Isla Cross. Cross and mm -hmm. Riel's dad was uh, born in Isle of Cross. You know, so we had all that, uh, like, you know, we had the history, we had the grave site, we had the church, we had the trenches, we had, you know, people that lived around there, they were still, mm -hmm. still from that, that era, and, uh, you know, the names were all there, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, the Lapines, and, uh, you know, yeah. uh, those, those... Howard Adams' relations. Yeah, with Howard Peter. Adams' That's relations, and, mm -hmm. you know, McDougall's, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all those names were there, so the history was still there, it was still kind of fresh, you know. And, clear uh, identity. Clear identity. Clear identity, there was identity. no question about mm -hmm. it. That could not be brought into question, and that's where we focused our attention. That that was the homeland of the Métis, and that was where our whole struggle began. And I think again, the the things that we led up to the constitutional discussions, which, like I said, we had a vision of in 1971 with the Victoria Conference, and I think the uh, and uh, Jimmy's alluded to it. We 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 always knew what we had in mind for the end result. But we, you know, we were not sure how to get there. When I when I look at both of your political careers and and what you did, you know, like here you were going to take Trudeau to court, and you know the highest, the most powerful man in all of Canada. Where did you find the strength to do that? I mean, all of the the voice to do this. And you know, I think back, you know, in the, in the yeah, Aboriginal conferences when you stood up and and you know your work that you've done over the years. Where where, where do you get the strength to do that? Because I know from my personal experience and, uh, that. It takes a lot of uh, strength to do that, you know, to get up and, and to voice what you believe in. Well, I think, I think uh, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, Sinclair, you know, talked about this, you know, uh, a lot in the past. Uh, uh, I think you get a lot of your strength from the community. You know, you, you know what you're trying to do is right. It's the right thing to do. And uh, you look at a little bit about the history and then you look at the racism, the institutionalized racism that you had to live under, you know, the terms and conditions of those things. And you know that eight, it's not right. So you got to go and try and change it. You got to try and do something. And that's what you're expected to do. That's why you're a leader. And when you're in a leadership position like that, uh, you know, it's tough sometimes. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, sometimes you're, you think that you're alone and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I've seen Sinclair in those kind of situations many, many times where you get actually physically sick because what are you going to do you know you get you get so wound up inside of you what if I screw up what if I don't what if I'm wrong in this and then and then just before you go and do that then you go to the communities and you say okay here's what I think here's the vision that I have and here's the direction I would like to go because here's the end result and here's how we get there sort of thing you know and then you do that and uh, uh, nine out of ten uh, if you get community support uh, the end result will 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 be all right, and uh, you know you will have felt you know felt a little bit better about it, and so you carry on like this over 
over uh, you know over over a period of time, and uh, it's never easy, but. Well, I can imagine it's never easy because, no. well, like you say, you never had a blueprint to do this stuff. That's you're right. you're blazing, new, you know, through new territory That's, here. Now, it must yeah. have been, must have been highly stressful. Any comments on that, John? Yeah, I you think you know that if, if you go back, as I said before, we're, we were always community oriented. We were always community oriented. Every, all of our work was done with the communities, and everything we done was, and it, it led to a board meeting or led to a larger meeting was talking to communities. I remember Drosher people telling us that we needed these high-priced consultants. And Grocer said, we don't need them. We've got 100,000 consultants, consultants out that's there. That's right. You know, Everybody in the community is a consultant. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think that's what really helped me as a leader because I never had to worry about what was happening at home. I never had to worry about a coup being done while I was in Ottawa because these people are out organizing to fight for these rights that everybody knew we had to get. It was another issue. Every time I'd go to a meeting, there'd be a vote of unconfidence that I wasn't maybe doing things enough, but it kept me on my toes. And I think that, again, like I said, uh, if there's a homework that were done by people like Jimmy who organized in the north and others who organized, of course, in the south and, 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 and kept this momentum going so that when I had a problem, I could phone home and people would support us, even our enemies, like they were always on side. So that was a phenomenon that I'll never forget. And I think that, uh, again, when you, when you look at it from that perspective, you, you will see why uh, that our homework and our groundwork was done so well in the mm -hmm. beginning that we really couldn't fail in that sense. Even if we'd lost everything, we couldn't fail because our community came, our communities came alive and they, they, they came to rush to help each other and they threw aside their differences. Even the political parties they belonged to didn't matter. It was these issues that were important to them. And that's something that I think that uh, we can never forget. And the leadership like myself, it's, it's just like almost I was already prompted and rehearsed to what to say and what to do. And I knew if I made a mistake in terms of uh, the word sellout was always used, if I'd made a mistake, I was going to pay more than a price of getting ousted. I would pay a bigger price because I, I would fail the people that had so much faith in us. So we, we, like we had no choice and things had to move ahead. And we had to fight other leaders who, again, including the Indian leaders who mm -hmm. didn't support us. Really, the Indians didn't support us in those constitutional conferences. We were completely on our own. Absolutely. Absolutely on our own because we had the... I got into fights with George Erasmus, the Indian leader, of which, uh, you know, would say one thing in a private meeting with the Prime Minister come out and say something different mm -hmm. when we got into the larger meeting. Yeah. So I raised hell with him. I said, you know, you're not going to step and trample on our rights. Uh -huh. We had the PTA at that time, which was called the uh, Prairie Treaty, 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 Treaty Alliance, uh, Alliance yeah. that were left out of the AFN because the AFN wasn't fighting on the basis of treaties. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all supported treaties as well as the Manitoba Act, which I thought was the Métis uh, Constitution. And uh, these people were left out and they were on the side. You couldn't get into the conference unless you had a pass. There was police, of course, everybody was there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, these people are left on the outside and they were looking in. And uh, the We brought them in. We brought them in and gave them a seat at our table. Passes, yeah. Uh -huh. and let them speak on their behalf. And uh, to be honest with you, we were the only people at that conference that actually supported the treaties being put in the Constitution. There was an argument by some of the major chiefs that saying, we don't want our treaties in the Constitution. They can stand alone, which I agree with. I'm not, not, but I said, look, if you want further guaranteed protection, make sure every time there's a step, get those treaties there so they're protected. And we fought for the protection of treaties and treaty rights and to make sure they're included in the Constitution. That mm -hmm. seemed odd coming from Métis people. Mm -hmm. So we weren't just on an Aboriginal rights thing for ourselves. We were there for everyone, mm -hmm. you know. And I think the best cooperation we actually got was from the Inuit because mm -hmm. they were much in the same boat as us and mm -hmm. they had very good spokespeople. We were at a time mm -hmm. when the spokespeople at that table were some of the best you'll ever see, you know. And of course, they had their consults, they had their people, but they had good spokespeople. And that made a hell of a difference when you went into those conferences and you, you knew that. And you faced some of the most intelligent, uh, uh, I wouldn't say intelligent maybe, let's use the word educated people in Canada. 
justice ministers. Uh, we had to, to deal with the uh, with the premiers. We had to deal with all our high priced mm -hmm. consultants, and it was just us fighting with them. And we had to go into meetings with uh, all of Canada's attorneys general, mm -hmm. and and argue with them about where a right should be. But one thing I found out from them when they were at the meetings, uh, once we were included in fighting on the basis for land, that there never was one attorneys general or justice minister or premier that ever said we didn't have rights. Mm -hmm. It was a matter of how we implemented them and how we dealt with how them. How you interpreted mm -hmm. them. Yeah. So I always tell that to people today. Don't ever believe that we don't have rights. Every, every province and every federal prime minister that we dealt with has said our rights were guaranteed. And true to his own words, don't come here and cry about your rights. Go home and practice them. I never mm -hmm. forgot that. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing we had to struggle with during the constitutional conferences. And we had to fight for those issues. And we had to deal with those issues. And we had to, you know, we, we like Drosha said, some of us became actually physically sick over the fact mm -hmm. that we had to yeah. stay up sometimes 24 hours a day and, yeah. and have some real arguments or mm -hmm. discussions about how we go about things. Because you know the half-breeds, the Métis, are not easy people to deal with because they have never accepted a leader since Louis Riel. You know that. They've never accepted a leader to the point where we could gather the people and pull that kind of mm -hmm. strength together. So it was one chance in a lifetime to do that because the Métis were very strong entrepreneurs. You know that as well as I do that. They had their own way of looking at things and they had their own way of dealing with things and they'd done it well. So it was hard for them to get together to really support one leader. But in fact, uh, I think after the first constitutional conference or the second one when I got into a kind of a fight with Trudeau uh, because Trudeau said to us at one time, he said, I see here that with the Métis or with the Aboriginal people, we got a social problem, he said. And I told, I said, Mr. Prime Minister, we haven't got a social problem in this country. We've got a political problem. And the political problem is the fact is that the government has not recognized our rights or give us the opportunity to exercise our rights or have not supported us in any way to exercise our rights. And uh, that time when we raised hell that time, uh, Trudeau had a supper at the Governor General's residence mm -hmm. where I wasn't even going to go. I stayed home because I was in the hotel uh, saying that uh, everybody was against us, you know, hotels used to going over there. And some uh, RCMP came to my door, of course, and they weren't there to arrest me. And they said that the prime minister is waiting for you at the governor general's residence. And I said, what am I going to do over there? And he said, no, he's waiting for you. So I got into, well, I was all dressed up, so I just mm -hmm. got into a cab and went over there. And they didn't start the supper until I got there. And I must have been a half an hour late, and I was thought I was going to just sit on the side, and somebody came and me to the door, and I sat around the table with the Prime Minister and the rest of the leaders. So he showed respect to us as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we became good friends after that, mm -hmm. you know, to the point where, uh, uh, you know, that him and I got along very well. But I knew what I was doing in Canada in and, and that time, that I'd always be treated like an outsider. I could never become a senator, even though I was offered a Senate seat in 19... Uh, at that time of the conferences. Yeah. Yeah. I'd never become part of government because of the way I took Canada to task. And it makes mm -hmm. sense. Even the Prime Minister, did. I'm invited to all the meetings today. Prime Minister will invite me to meetings, he'll invite me to lunch, Paul Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's as far as I get. Mm -hmm. Because they know my history and everybody is, uh, you know, you don't attack Canada and suddenly all of a sudden you're on the inside. Right. So it, it's, that would, it's a price that would you have to pay. would be looked at as a sellout, wouldn't That's, it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the people. So it, it, it's kind of a, a thing mm. that, uh, you know, you, you have to look back and, uh, you know, take a look again at, at, uh, uh, at the respect I have for the people in the communities, you know, that I have for all the communities that worked mm. so hard. And we had over 100 of them, Adros. How many locals mm. did we have? 105. And there were active, mm -hmm. active locals. Not mm -hmm. just all active. It was, it was uh, dealing with the issues. And we had to deal as well with providing the services at the same time, housing and everything else, because mm -hmm. we would have became a laughing stock if we didn't deal with issues. 
So we had to deal with these Bread things. and butter issues. Yeah. Bannock well, and lard issues. Yeah. I'll tell you, you guys did a tremendous job at the Constitution debates, I'll tell you that. From my perspective, anyways. Uh, can, can we go back a little bit to the, you know, like uh, getting the Métis in the Constitution? What was Harry Daniels' role in that? Were you were you working with Harry there? You want to speak another bit there? Yeah, uh, there, there was uh, you know a number of people that uh, that were uh, that were around like Tony Belcourt and uh, uh, Harry was another another fellow who uh, were belonged to the uh, the Native Council of Canada at that time, and they were they were of the opinion that they they could uh, you know that that council could speak on behalf of uh, Métis all across Canada. Mm -hmm. And of course we were, like Sinclair said, we were opposed to that. Uh, you know, we, we thought that, you know, the Métis were always considered to be a Western phenomena. And uh, <coughs> we wanted, uh, you know, we wanted, uh, you know, the Métis from Western Canada to speak on uh, Métis, uh, Western Canadian uh, Métis issues. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, you know, when we took, uh, Sinclair took the Prime Minister to court, uh, you know, they were, they were, of course, on the other side, uh, you know, they were, uh, that one, one, of the th one of the reasons, of course, that we, we decided to, to take a prime minister to court, at the same time, we were trying to form an organization that would represent the interests of Métis people in Western Canada, which we call, which is now known as the Métis National Council. But then, uh, and then, and then uh, you know, at, at that time, we belonged to the uh, to the uh, the other organization, what's uh, Briere's organization, uh, Native Council, Council of Canada. Native Council of Canada. Yeah, Native Council of Canada was was, uh, uh, for example, a good example is the uh, the province of Prince Edward Island had just as much votes on Métis issues as we had in Saskatchewan. And uh, you know it mm -hmm. was really unfair mm -hmm. and really not not right. And it's you know we didn't think that people from Eastern Canada should speak on our our issues, which you know we're, mm -hmm. which we had over here. And so, and we were denied that. We were denied that. We were denied that right uh, in the constitutional table. And that's the reason we took uh, the prime minister or Sinclair took the prime minister to court. But then, at the same time, we had to do something about that whole issue as well. So we made those changes. We fought hard and we had many arguments and we had a lot of discussion, heated debates and whatever you want to call them, uh, at, the, at, at, at our own tables, you know, at the, at the Media National Council, I mean, at, at the table, it wasn't the Media National Council, Native Council of Canada at that time. And we said, no, we want to get out of this Media National, out of this, out of this organization, which was led by Smokey Briere, I think at that time, and Harry and, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Tony Belcourt and these these folks. Uh, we said we want to get out of that. We want to form our own organization, which is going to have, which is going to truly represent Métis people in Western Canada. And uh, that's what we did eventually. But we had a we had a long struggle. It wasn't an easy thing to do. No, it wasn't easy. So how did the creation of the MNC change the political process for the Métis right after that? Oh. Well, then we started concentrating on our issues then. We didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, fishermen in Labrador or, or, uh, or uh, you know, uh, the, you know the, the, the other issues that those folks from, uh, from, you know, from down east are, are concerned about. Because, uh, you know, th we were concerned about, about rights for the Métis, you know, about right, uh, about, uh, uh, you know, those kind of things that, that, that we're talking about today, like, you know. Mm -hmm. And that made, that made a big d difference because then we could concentrate on, on those kind of things and it's right here and it's right at home. We didn't have to worry about something someplace else. Was one of the first orders on the agenda to start preparing for the First Minister's conferences on Aboriginal rights? Oh, of course. Yes, we must of course. spend a lot of time oh, on that. Oh, yes, you better believe it. We concentrated very heavy on that. And one of the first things that we had to do was we had to go back to the communities to tell people where things were at because they were always, you know, we didn't have the kind of TV that, like we have today in those days. We had no, none in the north, actually. So we, and the telephone service wasn't there either. There was no faxes. There was no. We just ha we had to go to the community. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a funny thing you mentioned that because uh, you know I, I, I people can call me a liar, but one thing I always believed in is that I always said the same thing in each community I went to, even if it had to be to offend some people in some of the communities. That because I always felt if I if I contradicted myself, I would then somehow get used to which I would know which story was which. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd be taken to task. 
And I remember going out in politics, and then you, without mentioning any names again, mm -hmm. you would hear some of our guys in one big community that say at Isla Cross come up and say they're going to do this thing and do all this, uh, you know, mention a certain issue and say, I'm going to do this when I get elected. Go on to Cumberland House at another meeting of three, four hundred people say exactly the opposite. You know, and I couldn't take them to task because mm -hmm. <laughs> I yeah. didn't want to get There's into no that way. kind of an argument. <laughs> 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 so, you know, it, it, it was, but it was the kind of meetings where people would be drawn out in the end and they'd have to, they'd have to be, uh, you know, they'd have to eventually, it would catch up with them, you know, it would mm -hmm. catch up with them. And, I, and like I said, if it wasn't for DeRocher, I wouldn't have been leader of the meeting for 20 years, which to me is uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, no one else has done that since Real. So that, that's something at least I got to look back on. It. And, it, and it was days when things were really, really tough. So we went through some of the toughest times in history since the Real uh, resistance. And, uh, and again, you know, it's, it's so much to look back and so much to be grateful for. And, and, and I wish that I could, you know, have each one of those people that we knew, you know, that you people had the resources to do a real history of those people in each community who contributed and how they fought and, and how they went to work and how they supported us and fought governments in order to make sure that our rights were protected, how they stood up and fought the church tooth and nail. You know, and, and we done that as, as, a, as a basis of, of not that we wanted to take people away from their religion, but we wanted to separate church and politics, church and, church and governance. You know, and take and take, take them missionaries. You know, yeah. they, they take them, take them. Uh, you know, because they they mistreated our people. You know, there was no yeah. doubt about that. Uh, you know, they that was well known fact. That's a well known fact. They they wouldn't allow you to speak your language, for example, and that's why so many people in the north. Uh, you know, the younger pe people, the people that went through their uh, the. Uh, the uh, residential schools, uh, you know, in the north uh, can't speak their language. They don't, you know, there's, there's such a gap there, there's a, you know, and they did, they did mistreat people and they had to be taken to task for that, you know. It's, yeah, it's, I understand that they even, there was even cases where the priest would say, well, you're not going to get the right to be buried in this church. Oh, exactly. that, oh they certain. told us that. Oh, yeah. I, mean, no, 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 that, you know, I was told that. Well, Jonas no. Favel was told that, you know, no. and, uh, you know, those. Unless you voted for yeah. were the liberals. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 You know, I don't think we should leave this meeting or this session without talking a bit about Rod Bishop because I oh, think, yes. you know, that Rod Bishop, uh, to me, again, we had our arguments. We used to have our tooth and nail arguments, and uh, he ran against me a number of times. But without people like Rod Bishop, there would never have been the Metis movement that is here today because he spoke up, he believed in what he said, and he was, uh, you know, he died a poor man with nothing, and yet we stood and accused each other how rich we're getting off mm. the meaty people, mm. you know, and uh, we, you know, we had those arguments, but his dedication to the rights of Métis people is unquestionable, you know. Uh, we disagreed on some of the processes we should, how we should get there, and we might have disagreed a bit on philosophy here and there, but the end result was the rights of the people, and I was, uh, I was uh, thought of that uh, many times. I went to his funeral and I thought this man fought his whole struggle, his whole life for the Métis people. And uh, what does he get for it? Really nothing. But, you know, I was so impressed by the fact that he resisted right to the end to the point where he didn't bear, get buried in a cemetery. Mm. They buried him on a hill beside his house, you know. And I thought to myself, that guy is still showing government that he's still not being bought off. Is that in protest to the church? Is that why he did that? Yeah. Well, he just said him because, up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was buried on the hill. Yeah. Interesting. So his cross is still there, and I think that uh, Bishop is, uh, you know, Bishop uh, along with a number of others should be yeah, Jonas really, yeah. really uh, appreciated in their communities. And I think that to me is a, is a very important aspect of, of our life to, to be dedicated to those people. Mm -hmm. Josephine so Pambrin? Yeah. The women, yes. Work so hard. So women, many women yeah. that, you know, like they, they toil every day yeah. in the communities and so on and they go unrecognized. Mm -hmm. Well, in our yeah. community. This is Morn from Turner yes. Lake, you know. We had, I think in our heyday, we had more than half of the women in our locals and communities were the leaders. Yeah, they were the leaders in the community. The leaders. They were the, the ones that the did, locals you know. and did all the work. If you needed to go to a community, that's who you went they to organized. see because they, yeah. they organized. They were the ones I that I really think they're the unsung sort of Oh yeah, that, absolutely. Know, that nobody really yeah. gives them a they work credit them. for what they've done. Yeah. They worked, and a lot of them choose not to be at the front table 
uh, not because they couldn't speak, but because they worked in the community and, and raised the issues and got people to the meetings to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, those women really, really were part of, a, more than part mm -hmm. of our whole process of uh, acquiring our rights. Mm -hmm. You know, they were so dedicated and so hard workers. And we had older women that worked with us in the, the field. Elders, Josephine yes. Cameron, yeah. you know. Uh, so many of these people. Rose just, Schneider. You know, Rose Schneider. Uh, old Agnes Stanley. Agnes Stanley, People Stanley, who yeah. just yes. worked so hard to make things happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and these people, some of them are still alive today, but they're sort of put in the background, you know. They're sort of put in the background. And I think that's a, that's a danger. That's a danger of us leaving our history where our community history is so important. Each community has got a story to tell. And each community contributed to our whole movement. And each community should be respected for that, you know. And I don't know how the leadership gets back to that grocer. I don't know how the leadership gets back to where uh, grocers sometimes would need knock on doors and just walk in people's house and help themselves to the soup and the stove. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, that's the way you do it. That's the way it was done in those days, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, people, oh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to knock on a door, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's, you know, and I, my belief is you could never get any place without knocking on people's doors and visiting in their home, you know. And mm -hmm. I think that's what got people moving. Mm -hmm. And our big struggle, I think, at Rocher, and we never talked about this much, is, is, our, is our struggle with the church of how we... Mm -hmm. We had to sit down and look of how do we get our elders who believe so much in this Catholic Church to support us like they wanted to in our movement and to, and to actually uh, give us the kind of support we needed without trying to say we're ta trying to take their church away from them. Mm -hmm. And that started our meetings with the Pope. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got to, to meet with the Pope and to get a letter finally from the Pope. Supporting our right, supporting our right to self-determination. He gave us the letter in 1987. Yeah, he, he met with uh, the Pope three or four times. Six times all the time. Was that, was that the first time in 87? Or was no, he, the last meeting is when he gave us the letter. How, and you met him before that a number of times? Oh, I met him five times and once yeah. in... Uh, five once times, in, and in, with time. me it was just once, once because I, I had less sins eh, than St. Clair. St. Clair had to go five <laughs> visits. <I think. laughs> So what was the, how did you end up visiting him the first time? If you don't well, mind. to bring him to Canada uh, was our first visit. To bring him to Canada, to inviting, Europe, him, inviting him to Canada, and where in Canada was the big issue. And of course, we said uh, the Northwest Territories because Steve Caffey, who became the premier of the Northwest Territories, and Jim Antoine, who was the a, old, a, old Jim, a yeah. good chief, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we invited. We wanted to. Uh, we went to Rome to try to get him to come to Canada, and mm -hmm. as a result. He came as far as Yellowknife once and he had to go back home. That's when Harry Daniels gave him his coat in the airport. He, he just happened to be over there. there. <laughs> jacket. Be the jacket. And so so oh, then the yeah. Pope, we had to go back to bring him back again. So, you know, he, was mm -hmm. go he wasn't going to come back. So we got him back to Fort Simpson. Mm -hmm. And at the last meeting we, we had, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, I was, I was uh, so well known with the Pope at that time that we had... Uh, each person was allowed to bring four or five people to be blessed mm. by the Pope and, and you know, Holy Communion. The Holy the Communion, yeah. So uh, the leader said, I had, I had the, I had the, the uh, option of bringing as many as 30 people to meet with the, the Pope. So I had a whole lineup of elders in the north and mm -hmm. that, you know, and that changed the whole thing. It changed the whole feeling between the church and the people and more reality came to there because the Pope is a very progressive guy himself. He's very strict on the rules, fine, but but he was also very supportive of rights. So that's what you used him for in the sense that, you know, like it's, it's okay to fight for your rights and yeah, the church will, is yeah. with you on that? Yeah, is that the, the kind yeah, of the message church, you got? The there? church is the church. Look after our spiritual needs and and the and the and the political process is up to us to acquire our rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. the message we got across to the Pope and, and because we were also talking about a peaceful process. We're mm -hmm. talking about a military. Yeah, we need we need to take ownership of our own. Mm -hmm. You know, we know what our problems are. You know, we know mm -hmm. what the problems are. We want to do something about it, but they got to be done by Aboriginal people. But governments has a, have a responsibility to to uh, accommodate that. You know, to help mm -hmm. us achieve those things. I mean, they are, mm -hmm. they've been spending billions and billions of dollars trying to uh, trying to address the so-called Aboriginal problem, Métis problems, and stuff. Uh, you know, we can we can do it for, you know, for, for next to nothing, 
mm -hmm. know, to, to be able to handle our own our own affairs. But we need the right to, you know, we need those rights to, you know, be recognized and to be able to govern ourselves and look after our own institutions. And we used people like the Pope, uh, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. we used them, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and he knows that he knows we used them. But that's what he's there for, mm -hmm. to to help us bring that message to Canada, to to the, you know, to the. Prime Minister of Canada, the premiers, and uh, you know the mm -hmm. ambassadors, and uh, you know because Saint Clair spent a lot of time in uh, in places like uh, you know the European uh, Parliament, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on a, quite a number of occasions. United Nations, United as well. United Nations as well, mm -hmm. trying to convince uh, you know folks at that level to tell Canada to 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 give us an opportunity to to look after ourselves, you know, to address our own concerns. How effective Those kind was, of that, was that strategy? That, that was pretty effective. I, I think I think that the Pope, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, Catholics in this country. Oh, you know, and, uh, yeah. And, uh, and the, you know, the Pope's letter, I remember the Pope's letter being read in uh, in the Church in Isle of Cross, for example. Here's what, the church, yeah, here's what the church is saying. Here's mm -hmm. what the Pope is saying about, about rights, about Métis rights, about Aboriginal rights. Mm -hmm. And then there was that whole con uh, reconciliation process that was mm -hmm. happening at the same time, and uh, uh, the residential school issues were a big, big thing at the same time. And so the Pope addressed all of those things in that letter that uh, Jim yeah. talks about, and this letter was read throughout Canada in all the in all the churches that you know that, uh, at one time or another, and uh, mm -hmm. and that had a big impact, right. uh, you know, because the Prime Minister at that time said, "Oh, gee, we better." You know, we better start making some moves here. Let's start talking mm -hmm. about, you know, and rights. you got the support of the international community. Yeah. Through the international I think the other thing, too, is that the, the Pope, uh, our first and second meeting was fine. It was fairly businesslike. And, but I think we kind of became friends after the second meeting. I, you know, he, he more or less always gave me a private session with him to sit down and talk with him, which mm -hmm. he does only to some of the, the world leaders, mm -hmm. uh, rather than just a group session. And... Uh, he was able to uh, invite me back each time, otherwise I would never have been back to see him that many mm -hmm. times. And at the last meeting in 1987, when he came to uh, Fort Simpson, uh, none of the national leaders had ever met him at that time, except for myself. And there were three new leaders. I think one of them was George Erasmus. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was a lady from the Inuit. And, uh, and of course, I think Smokey Breer was there on the Native Council mm -hmm. of Canada. And uh, I was a little late uh, getting on the stage. They were introducing or Gary him. Gould. Maybe. Yeah, Gary Gould. There, there was, uh, I was a little late on getting on the stage where the Pope was to address the people. And they were introducing the leaders. And uh, I was coming in from the back of the stage. And they were going to introduce me. And uh, they introduced me. And the Pope said, oh, I know Jim. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it seemed quite a, it seemed, seemed quite a, you know, a thing to have that happen by the Pope himself, you know, because, you know, people, uh, even in Italy, when you, when you remember the time we went to see him there and uh, some of the Italians wouldn't believe us. You're coming here to see Papa? You'll mm. never <laughs> see him. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry to see you know, him. <laughs> you'll never see yeah. him. And, said, and I said, oh, no, we're here to visit the Pope. And, uh, you know, so that kind of that kind of thing, I think, really, really helped us in terms of, of, uh, of uh, working with uh, this present Pope in order to to get to get what we did in terms of our rights in the Constitution and uh, our support from uh, Canadians because and from the communities too did you get support from the, the older group after that uh, oh yeah oh yeah we did we got we, we mm -hmm. were already getting mm -hmm. support from yeah. them because we had a number of meetings over the years with the Pope too mm -hmm. not all at once eh? yeah. and I think they were going as the constitutional meetings were going on in fact the Pope uh, there was a press release where the Pope scolded Mulroney for his treatment of average of people mm -hmm. when Mulroney mm -hmm. went to visit him one year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so that was uh, very well done in the press so you know uh, Mulroney didn't like it but at the same time because this is one of the reasons we had to go outside of Canada, too, and uh, Drosha will tell you, because we had Canadian ministers going to these United Nations meetings and these meetings over the world bragging on sure. how great they yeah, treated us. Exactly. You know? yeah. mm -hmm. So we had, we had to said, go tell the truth. I said, yeah. we have to get over there. So yeah. my first trip again to the United Nations, and uh, you know, I still don't know how I ever got there to speak to the United Nations, and there was a a huge crowd in that uh, meeting and outside there was even uh, uh, movie stars out there demonstrating along for the rights of our people at that mm -hmm. time and uh, 
we met some of them and uh, in fact I was part of the demonstration I was mm -hmm. went up there and I was uh, uh, walked up there with uh, uh, the guy they called Max and uh, What's the name of that uh, police show they used to have? Yeah, I know. I they still show reruns of it now. And uh, what the heck was the name of that police show? I can't remember. There was a. Uh, they called him Max in there, anyways. I forget his. his I forget his mm -hmm. real name. No, it was his name is Max. I think, yeah, I think his name is. But Max. we met with some of them and uh, and and uh, went to the United Nations. So we spoke there, and uh, I was invited to the European Parliament. Uh, I think three times in uh, Strasbourg, France, and in. Uh, Germany. In Munich, Germany, once in Vienna, Vienna, Vienna Austria, uh, to speak to them, and I, I was able to get our points across again. We spoke to the European, to the British Parliament mm -hmm. during the Constitutional House of Lords. discussions. Yes, House of Lords. Yeah. And I was invited to, uh, but that was after the Constitutional talks, to speak in Australia at the United Nations conference. So I was uh -huh. able to get around a lot of those places to speak to people on behalf of the Métis, uh, which again, you know, gave us an opportunity to make sure the Métis were recognized across the world. Mm -hmm. So it, it gave us it gave us some good chances and I think again, the, uh, I think, you know, that uh, I always go back and say that these things would never have taken place without the so many people that you, nameless people. Mm -hmm that were out there helping us and, mm -hmm. and working with us and, and our people who really supported us and worked hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, the grocer spent the money for the, I don't know if we ever did get the money back. <laughs> no, we didn't. But, <laughs> 50, you know, 50,000, that was the best 50,000 <laughs> well anyway. <laughs> 50, sure. we yeah. ever invested in our life <coughs> yeah. to, to get that opportunity, you know, and to, uh, I don't know how we ever accounted for 50,000 was a lot of money in those <laughs> days, oh, yeah. you know, sure in those days. Still a lot of money. And nobody yes, else had put a cent in for us. Nobody, nobody else. Yeah, yeah. They were all scared yeah. because they didn't think anything would ever happen. Yeah. Nothing would happen. Mm -hmm. They thought we'll get sent home because the Treaty Unions tried to take the Treaty Unions tried to take the Prime Minister to court later yeah. on along yeah. the same issues. Yeah. No, they wouldn't have. Forts would have nothing to do with it. Hmm. But we were able to do it. So you know, it's it's it's, uh, it's again. Uh, I think I think it went gamble, back to yeah. our organization, our organizational work. Mm -hmm. You know, that all led up to all these things happening at the top. Without that groundwork, nothing would have happened at the top. That's why I say that every Métis person in Saskatchewan in those years had something to do with the Métis getting into the Canada's Constitution. So mm -hmm. each child descendant from those people can be proud of their families for the work that's been done. You know? Exactly. The, you know, it was a community uh, effort. That's what it was. So how can uh, uh, some of these young people ever go back and say, well, I wasn't involved. You know, their parents and grandparents parents, and uncles and aunts yeah. were involved. Every family had somebody involved in terms of that We used process. to have meetings. We used to have four or 500 people in Green Lake. Yep. Little Green Lake, Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. where you're from originally, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And we had, you know, people. your dad was in many of those meetings, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of the elders that, you know, that were there, uh, the fiddlers, remember the fiddlers? Oh, yeah. They were, they were yeah. there, yes. Absolutely. In fact, old Bishops, Tom Fiddler's yeah, still old alive, Tom, isn't he? Yeah, old Tom is still alive, yes, absolutely. So, you know, we, we, had, we had these people would come to meetings, uh, places like... Uh, Pine House, you know, yeah. Philip Martin, Halls. yeah, Martin, mm -hmm. Martin Smith, Hall. and uh, you know, uh, his wife, Martin Smith's wife, and uh, Tinker's, uh, yeah. you know, and Tinker's wife, uh, you know. Yeah. They're, they're I remember right. going to Cumberland House where we had five, six hundred people at a meeting. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can't do that today. Yes, you cannot do mm -hmm. that today, no matter what you do. And and people like Drosha, that's where you talk about making the bannock and the moose meat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, Drosha was one of our leaders, and he had to go to hall water for the ladies to make damn sure <laughs> they had enough. Yeah. At the time we had, <laughs> oh, yeah. he had the ladies going to holy water by the field <laughs> yeah. to bring it in to help them cook their meal. So Before you know, running water. everybody participated. You had running water, but you had to run down the hill to go to the, yeah. to the lake. To get well, I remember looking back on those conferences, and, I, I, and, and it gave me a feeling of pride of mm -hmm. being a oh, yeah. person it because could. you know that's it the first could. national forum we've had, mm -hmm. you know, since probably. You know, 1885, where they, you know, there was all that negative stuff about the media, but certainly, uh, I was just when I saw that, you know, the leadership mm -hmm. and all the work you had, people like you did, I was really, really feeling proud about that. If I could uh, talk about uh, the conferences, how did you feel about, uh, you know, the first conference? Did you have a, a sense of, you know, 
now we're going to get something done where you really uh, where you're really feeling like you know this now is our opportunity to you know move forward on self-government and, and you know our Aboriginal rights and so on and how yeah, disappointed there, there were was, you were you yeah. feeling like you know you started out really you know high hopes and then you got dashed yes. and you could see a yeah. sort of trend setting there, 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 there was a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, not you know we're not sure We've were the never premiers done it were the premiers really uptight saying no 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 I don't want well to do this yeah, yeah Jim Jim had that? some pretty good arguments with some of the because he sat at the you know at the, at the, at the as the head of the uh, you know the the, uh, the Métis delegation and uh, you know a lot of the premiers for example uh, Van der Zam who you know a lot of those guys didn't really understand they didn't really know and so there was a little bit of educating to do you know and how do you mm -hmm. get how do you educate people for example who are so used to having authority and not having to listen to anybody like you know a lot of these premiers had that attitude mm -hmm. and so you had to do something like to bang the table and get their attention and say listen here's what we're all about here's who we are and here's what we want you know those kind of things and that's where you know Sinclair you know was able to do those kind of things particularly when he went after it he got a lot of attention mm -hmm. when he got after after divine for mm -hmm. example you know? that was in the last Meeting. Last meeting. That was in the last meeting. Conference. That's right. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and we got a lot of attention out of that because we weren't getting we weren't getting the kind of attention that we we needed to have, you know, to be able to make our points and to, make, to be able to make our you know to, to to make our arguments and to be able to have a discussion to to discuss have a good discussion about the things that we're putting on the table, you know, and uh, you know things like real real attention getters. For example, Sinclair used the analogy. In Saskatchewan, in Uranium City, you pay the same amount of money for a 40-ounce bottle of rye as you do in Regina, mm -hmm. and yet you you buy you, the milk is is is, is at least 200% uh, more mm -hmm. in Uranium City than than it is in Regina. So you're subsidizing booze, and you're not subsidizing food for babies. Mm -hmm. You know the, those kind of analogies, mm -hmm. and that really caught on, and that really mm -hmm. you know really really helped uh, put our message across. Mm -hmm. And uh, you better believe it, uh, you know, Grant Divine paid attention after that, you know. A lot of it was negative. When we got home, we got cut off our funds, for example, you know. Yeah. Uh, right, uh, within, within two or three hours, we got cut off our funds. As soon as Sinclair was finished, I think, uh, you know, Grant Divine went to the phone. Finished, yeah, <laughs> before he was finished. Before he was finished, somebody ran to the phone and said, hey, cut these guys off because we got was, back and there was no money. What was the role of Romano? Was he a Romano was in, uh, in that in, just before you spoke to the Vine? Yes, he was. He was a, a, a Dumont hired him for consultant. Remember? Yeah. yeah. And Romano was sitting with us up there yeah. before. Yeah, I, spoke. I saw that in the yeah. background there. You know. Yeah. And his advice to me was not to rock the boat. Uh, oh, is that right? Don't lose your money. Don't lose your funding. Don't get keep a cool head, and go down there and uh, sort of. Uh, there'll be another time. And I, and I, on the way down there, you know, I had a lot of people coming to me and saying, you know, the old word, don't yeah. sell out. Don't sell out. Uh, Stay on the you. course, let's, let's you, you know, and, uh, get at her. That again, you know, I, I thought it over very carefully and I thought I'll never get this opportunity never. again. Never, I'll never. Get this once forum in a lifetime again. thing. Mm -hmm. I've got to tell it like it is. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll take my chances. Uh, the money, I felt at that time, the money people forget about, but I'll never forget about what I say. That's right. Conference. We had four chances, four chances in five years. Yeah, can't blow them. You got yeah. You got yeah. But if you think about it now, you know I believe, and I've always did believe that we had enough in the Constitution by recognizing the rights of our people, than by putting three pages in there, because I always have and had a feeling that a constitutional document or a document that recognizes rights should be very simple. Mm -hmm. It should not be a broad mm -hmm. document because the broader the document. document is, the more mm -hmm. it restricts your rights rather than enhances Yeah, then you can interpret it all Because it leaves you the opportunity from square one to say you have these rights. It's a matter of applying them and implementing them. And that's the job that the next generation has to do. And that's where I think maybe we went astray a bit we dis we abandoned ourselves too early, and we got into the business of delivering programs and taking that away from the community and not keeping a political core that actually did these things. And I think the other mistake that was made, and again, it's only my version, you'll get other people that'll come here and tell you a different version, that if we set up that parliament at Legislative Assembly in Batoche, 
and held it twice a year and made laws even that we'd only abide by, eventually those laws by convention would be recognized. Mm. You know, and I use the word convention because during the constitutional con uh, talks, convention was used, and convention is mm. not a written law. Convention is just something that, yeah. that happens yeah, over years and right? becomes recognized. Yes. Yeah. And I felt that that would That's bring us into more where people would recognize our laws mm -hmm. more and more and more, yeah. you know, and mm. I think that's the basis of, of what I had the feeling of doing, and I, and I felt, again, I know that government cost a lot of money, but I said, look, let's share our money with an opposition, so when we go into parliament, we can have an opposition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we can have mm -hmm. our opposition, and we'll provide them, we'll share our funding, because it'd be unfair if we had that's right. a, a group, and Drosha and I, because we're part of an executive, part of the same team, would turn there and bring everybody else in who didn't have any money. So mm -hmm. we'd have to share our money mm -hmm. and talk about the issues and discuss the issues and have an open forum. A debate. Where we, the yes. debate. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And then make some laws from those debates and go back and try to keep them. Now we don't have a police force to enforce them or a justice system to really apply them because the way people think today they're saying, well, we can't have a self-governance. We can't have a justice system unless we have these judges. All this elaborate system. That's not the way it. you set up. Yeah. You just started up by making simple laws and getting people to obey. And get the communities get to, the community get the to communities obey. Get the communities to enforce those things. You hit an, an, an interesting point. And in, uh, when you talk, when you look at the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan, this idea of an opposition, what do you think about an opposition in regards to an opposition party in regards to the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan that would be in the, along the same lines where you have an opposition? I think that would be healthy. I think you that do. would be a healthy, healthy thing, yeah. at providing yeah. head a legislative assembly. And it, and it prevents in infighting as mm -hmm. well, you know, because you sometimes, right now, sometimes the reality is you sit in the same table and you don't like each other for some reason, you know, so you bicker and you fight and then you, and then you take that outside, you take it to the, and the community see that, you mm -hmm. know. If you had an opposition, okay, you go sit over there and then I'll sit over here mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, let's debate. That's right. You know, then, 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 then it's an official opposition. Mm -hmm. Then, then it becomes official, and it becomes something that you can work on. You know, that you can, you can, uh, and that's the way it's supposed to be. I have no problem with that. I've never had a problem with that. Okay. And you support your institutions. Right. Your institutions has to be independent. They, they, they have to be independent of the way that they can operate, but yet in the same sense responsible to the leaders in the terms of of its accountability, which the leaders in turn are responsible to the people. Mm -hmm. and you do that through a democratic process where there's one person, one vote. And I strongly believe in that today, yet, that, that that should happen. But on a national level, uh, I, I don't know about having one national leader again. I, I always believed in a coalition or kind of a federation mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. rotate chair people. A spokesperson. You don't ever yeah. have okay. all the same spokespeople because, again, you have your community which, which you want to keep them involved. And if you wanted a national leader, you would all have to vote democratically for that national leader. But then does the national leader really speak for everybody? Right. Where your province is mm -hmm. as far mm -hmm. as you should go, and then your, your national body should consist of all these provinces sitting there. You had or, a rotating yeah. chair. Rota that's you know, what we wanted. That gives everybody chair. an opportunity, everybody that's part of that group. And the an government can't co op one person. We can't. Yeah. What I always believed in, and I don't believe in this whole concept of a Senate, uh, you know. What I've always believed in was maybe a council of elders or something like that. You have a council of elders, but you don't give that council any constitutional powers, you know, because they're not elected, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the mistake that, uh, that, you know, a lot of people are making and, uh, you know, that really shows up, uh, you know, now. Uh, you know, they're having a lot of problems with the Senate because the Senate has been given constitutional powers and the biggest power they've been given is the power to uh, to uh, run the membership? I mean, they can they, they can look at a member, they can pick out your name and mm -hmm. say, hey, you're no longer mm -hmm. on there, and take you right off. And then what recourse do you have? You know, because they're not elected, you can't go through the democratic process of trying to get them out uh, elected out, or uh, you know. So so those kind of things you know exist, and they you know there needs to be some changes in those things. I have no problem with a council of elders that are, you know, going to sit there and then you, you talk to them, uh, you know, on, on issues, on constitutional matters, constitutional issues or as rights As an advisory matters. board? As an advisory yeah. board and, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, you, need, you, you need that because, we, you know, uh, Aboriginal there people have always, knowledge. yeah, they have mm -hmm. a lot of knowledge and, uh, you know, you need mm -hmm. to use that, that knowledge. But you don't give them constitutional 
powers that uh, that that they're not, especially when they're not answerable to anybody. You know, they're not. Mm. That's that's an argument I have because I noticed that uh, you know that some local elections people are the whole local is. is Ballot boxes thrown. Oh, they they kick out ballot boxes. And, yeah. and again, I, I I will never buy into that because you can't leave out whole communities. I mean, there could be a number of reasons why they're out there, why they're it's done that. But the, it takes away the whole concept of this one person, one vote. You know, sure we had problems in our days, but yeah. we still let them vote. We That's went right. through an argument yeah. if we thought somebody was doing wrong things with the ballots, but we never took away people's right to vote. You know, yeah. you don't do that, and you don't. You don't take a membership. I was, I was the time they took the membership away from Howard Adams. As much as Howard and I got into arguments, I said you can't do that. You can't, you can't. take a membership away from me. You can't kick him out of his yeah. homeland. Noriega, of all the things he done wrong in Central America, he they still wouldn't kick him out of the country. They mm -hmm. still wouldn't say he was, he mm -hmm. was banned. You know, Indians had ways of doing it in the old days, of banning mm -hmm. people out That's of the right, tribe. Yeah. But you know, you cannot take a person and just say, I'm taking away your membership for such and such a reason, you no longer are a Métis. You can't do that. You can't deny a person. You can't deny a person. Métis, right. So Métis, you know, that's you, what he is. You, we've always took Métis the approach of inclusive mm -hmm. rather than excluding. You know, I want to be inclusive. People should be mm -hmm. inclusive. I want to find ways of screening in, not screening out. Mm -hmm. That's the way I've always looked. You find that that's happening, though, when you think about if there's... I mean, when I look at the definition of who a Métis person is from, say, the 60s when it was quite broad, because it drew in, you know, mm -hmm. status, and, uh, sorry, non-status and, and, uh, and Métis people because, you know, when AMS is formed, they wanted to lobby the government outside of the Indian mm -hmm. Act and so on. Quite a broad definition even in, in Alberta and, uh, you know, in the 1930s and forward up until recently. Now the definition is narrowing, at least it was for a while. Is this based on rights or, you know, like if there's any rights that Métis people have? Is that, you know, I see that definition narrowing a bit. And I know that now the the definition is something like, well, you have to be a member of the historic Métis nation, but really, how do you... Who is the historic Métis nation? That's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And how do you prove that, that a person was... That. I mean, what, what are they... They still have to go back to things like script or something. Well, well, well yeah, well, uh, you know, not only that, but uh, but it's it's lifestyle as well. Uh, you know, Métis people have lived, uh, you know, a certain lifestyle based on the Aboriginal, you know, way of life, I guess. And uh, it's, it's community acceptance as well, mm -hmm. because in the North, you have no problem with that. You yeah. know who the Métis sure. are in the North. Sure. You know? no Where you start running into that kind of a problem is in Saskatoon and Regina and, you know, the big, big... They never community. belong to the community. Yeah, right. They're opportunists yeah. in some way. That's how the community yeah, looks at them. that's right. That's how the community looks at them. But, you know, in our recent census, the 19... No, sorry, the, uh, the 2001 census, now the census tells us that 30% of the Métis population are in, are in urban areas now. That's probably true. In fact, I'd say maybe yeah. even more. Yeah, I'd so say, that's I'd this say is, even more. Yeah. And not only that, when you talk about the definition, of, you know, you have people in Labrador now and the Maritimes and so on. So mm -hmm. you you know you, you talk and, about the and, homeland uh, of many people in the West, and you're you're creating another category Harry. here too. That goes back to Harry Daniels, a pan Canadian. And I yeah. never oh, bought yeah. into that neither. Yeah. Never bought into that. <laughs> that's all right. You know, I don't even know what it means. I don't know what it means. Talk of what is a pan Canadian? You know so. I've always believed in the Métis or the Métis or the Métis, but again, uh, when you start, when you start talking historic Métis, Red River Métis, you're talking about class again, and I don't want to see class or second-class citizens in the in the in the Métis nation. I think everybody should be equal. There's no such a thing as a upper class, lower class. So uh, the definition should be broad enough to include those people who. Uh, who want to be Métis and who feel they're Métis and uh, bring them in and, uh, you know, they're comfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the main thing. And you, you look after your nation. Mm -hmm. well, well, you know, one of the realities, another reality that no one ever talks about, of course, is, uh, you know, Red River. Yeah, okay, Red River, Métis. That's, a, that's fairly recent in the history of Métis people. That's a recent thing that happened in the Red River. So, we have, in Saskatchewan, you have two communities, Isle La Crosse and Cumberland House, which are at least a hundred years older than the Red River. Mm -hmm. And there's Métis there, always has been Métis. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So where do they belong? That's where right. do they belong? And they're older than Red River. You know? yeah. So you're in favor then of a, of a broader definition? A broader, broader definition. Well, yeah, what it about a person, be so restrictive. What about a person that says that uh, nowadays, well, I found out that, you know, my great-great-grandfather had some Aboriginal blood, therefore I'm Métis. 
What do you say to a person like that if they want to be made to? That's a difficult situation. Uh, I think the best definition I was ever given about who should be a Métis again was, remember time Fred's, Fred's story came along, yeah. oh, okay, you're thinking of the one, I mean, <laughs> so, yeah. Wayne McKenzie stands at one end yeah. and I stand at the other and everybody in between is a Métis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't be, you can't be blacker than Jim Sinclair or any whiter than Wayne McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. you know that that's that's been said a lot of times. But again, you know, uh, as far as uh, the Métis, again, you know, you 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 got to be careful because uh, you get some people again who are who are who are who would like to belong, and maybe historically they want to belong because they, they want to identify their history. But then you got the real what <laughs> Drosher again calls the mainstream Métis, which people today are. are you know, in the struggle, they, mm. they, they're identifiable. They can't fit into a crowd, you know. Mm -hmm. And I know that offends some people. But in our days, when we first started organizing, that's the way people were. Mm -hmm. You walked into a meeting, all brown faces. Mm -hmm. As as the programs come in, a little lighter, a little lighter, a little lighter. And you know, in that way, it it goes on Real's concept and of, of helping everybody and we're and living with everybody, mm -hmm. just the poor and the oppressed, get them all together. So. There's nothing wrong with that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, uh, I've always been in an argument that, that uh, look, the people that are the half breeds, and that goes back again, even in the old days. I think they did they did call people French half breeds. Mm -hmm. uh, you might recall that mm -hmm. they called people English half breeds mm -hmm. and Scottish half breeds. Mm -hmm. And today, I still see people who do that, but they were all half breeds. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. they, they, didn't <laughs> they didn't take them out and said, "Well, you're somebody else." But so I think people today have to have to take a very close look at, at how they build their nation. Because again, if you get too broad, then they'll say, why do you need any rights when you can vote in anybody you want because you have the majority? Yes. Know? And if you get too narrow, then you're leaving out people who yeah, really should be that's there. That's why I think the definitions are getting narrower and narrower. Because mm -hmm. if there's anything, any kind of rights that do flow to the, the Métis people because of script or whatever, mm -hmm. then you know those people well, only be entitled to that if they get a lump sum. I've never liked people using the identity to the Métis in terms of script. Script was not just for the Métis. Script was for the soldiers, mm -hmm. the RCMP, mm -hmm. anybody who wanted script Settlers to get the script. They got yeah. script. And, and yeah. why suddenly it was a, a, for us, for our people who so, got some script. It should not it be a means of, of identity. Mm -hmm. no. No. Because you know. it, was, it was too broad. Mm -hmm. Again, very broad. It, mm -hmm. Why should people give us the rights? Because a little piece of land that many people, and we've proved that through our work mm. and through our studies over the years, that people came in and, and didn't even put their X. Somebody else did it for them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, the same, much the same way as the treaty was done, because some people were left out of treaties, you know? It's, we used to use the word hang around the fort Indians, the only yeah. ones that, you know, were around, the, you know, people around the fort, the people around the hunting and looking after themselves were not coming in to, to sign some of these, uh, so were left out. Mm -hmm. So again, mm -hmm. the, the Métis people are in the same boat. They, people stole their scripts. Uh, people, white people, even picked out a Métis name and uh, put an X on yeah. it and took the land. And the, mm -hmm. that's how the uh, is it the uh, Canadian uh, which bank uh, got a lot of out of it? The Imperial Bank of Commerce. Mm -hmm. One of them is the Bank of Montreal. Mm -hmm. You know, got you rich can't use, yeah. fortune on that. You can't Maybe use script, script uh, you know, because that was such it's a fraudulent. Uh, you know, you can't use that as fraud. a basis for uh, you know, no, sir. as a basis for uh, Métis, Métisism or being identified as a Métis because it was it was a fraudulent. Uh, you know, a piece mm -hmm. of uh, of our no. history. You know, no. it just wouldn't. No. You know. Mm -hmm can't do that. I, I won't buy into that. I, I would I, never I, buy into that. I hope. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it really is a thorny issue, uh, oh, identity, just, yeah. because when I think about it, and you know, you, you point out Cumberland House and so on, that these communities were outside of Red River, and, and I think about it historically, and I spend a lot of time thinking about it. I mean, I, when I think about growing up in Prince Albert, I knew I didn't belong to First Nations society, and I didn't belong to mainstream society. I knew myself that I was in between, mm -hmm. and I've always felt that way. It was like an, almost like an inner essence mm -hmm. to some extent that you know I belonged to some, somewhere else, but not to those two communities. And I would never really was accepted in either mm -hmm. communities, and so I was in the yeah. middle. Yeah. And so you know, I think a lot of people have felt like that historically, and that's what drew us together too. But that's not there's not enough said about that, but. Mm -hmm. I mean that is a thorny issue, and, and uh, how that's ever going to—if we can ever get a, a good identity, I don't, uh, definition of identity—I don't think it's ever going to happen. But, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I to just, be realistic, if you look at the whole future of this, I see down the road. Uh, if you if you look at the Bill C-31 issue, I see down the road 50 years. 
treaties with no treaty unions. That's right. Because yeah, Bill T-31 exactly. is going to pull everybody out of treaties. It's so the next largest termination. It's, that's right. The next rights. largest organization that's going to be is the non-status Indians again, all over again. <laughs> that's so right. Start to right. Cycle. Exactly. Yeah. You know, because so of the six twos, you have yeah, to remarry yeah, again right. into status. You're going to find out that again. Yes. You know, you're going to have. You know, so. So the, the, the Métis are not dead yet. They're going well, to be back to life with all these, these yeah. large groups of people that's not going to be on well, the Canadian region. identity might be Métis when yeah. you think about the, so, you know, the you population know, you, increase. You, you, you have to look towards the future. Yeah. But again, I think the leadership today is my... I would be after land and partners and resources and the sharing, you know, resource sharing agreements. Are very, very, that was recommended mm. years ago by Lawrence Beta. and the Beta Commission. Yeah. We said that's a good deal. Mm -hmm. And today when government asks me uh, today, what can we do? We've got to have another study. I say, look, go back to the Beta Commission. You don't need go another back. study, yeah. Go back to Lawrence, what Lawrence you went around and, mm -hmm. and supported and worked. Lionel so de Chambeau. Lionel de Chambeau. Yeah. The, the Northern Municipal Council at that time was to, to deal with all these issues. But of course, the government only gave them things that government wanted to give them, you know, so they could end up endorsing government and be part of a political arm of the government. And, you know, that's the way governments have operated over the years. They, they keep lying to you and they, they, you know, there's no real effort to recognize the rights of the people. And, they, and the, of all the racism that's in this country of Canada, the worst is economic racism. I can stand people uh, calling me names, I can stand people doing things, like, but when it comes to economics and I'm left out of a system because I don't have any money and I've made sure the doors are closed on me wherever I go, that's the worst kind of racism, and that's what's in this country is hurting us the most. I think a lot of people would agree with that. I think so. When you think back on on um, what was what was the feeling? If we can go back to the the uh, conferences on Aboriginal rights, what was the feeling after you know, like the conferences were over and, and really nothing was accomplished? I mean, you had premiers like uh, I can't remember was Hatford, Van der Zand, Van der particularly Zand. divine. What is self-government? You know, what is the model you're looking at? What's it going to cost us? You know, how much power are we going to lose? What was the feeling of 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 the you know of everybody at there at that time about you know, when when things failed? I mean, well, you know, for me, I look back and I don't think it was a failure now, Joe, mm -hmm. should you? Mm -hmm. No, I don't. I look yeah. back and say the rights of the Métis people are recognized it's for the our, first time ever. We're part of Canada legally. Mm -hmm. it's, we, we have failed, yeah. you know, we so, failed so far. We're, you know, we're, we're following up, yeah. doing the kind yeah. of things that are there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that when the Constitution uh, was patriated, yeah, we failed to get it, uh, to, to, to stop it from being patriated, or to bring it home. But leaving it there was yeah. no good to us neither. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we, we, we were, mm -hmm. you know, we, we had to do something. So when they did bring it home, uh, you know, Trudeau at that time, of course, uh, you know, so indicated very clearly, yes, uh, we are going to put the three, the three peoples in the Constitution, you know, Indian, the Inuit, and the Métis. And uh, we were very pleased about that. We were very happy. Finally, we're going to be on there, except for and then we, we get into that little, that little fights that we got into and a little, you know, the fact that we took the prime minister to court to make sure that the and they real Métis... And they did kick on. us out of the Constitution yeah, for a while. They, for a while, yeah, they, they did, did yeah. kick us out. Mm -hmm. right, they took us yeah. out and put the women in. Yeah. That's, that's right. when we had that big demonstration where all of a sudden we're back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, so anyway, you know, we, we, we got back in and then, uh, you know, we... We uh, we uh, fought hard to get you know those those kind of rights. What what you know we we tried to give them our interpretation of what the rights those rights were like hunting and fishing and mm -hmm. those, those kind of things. And we basically said that our rights are the same as the First Nations people. You know mm -hmm. those kind of rights. Eh? So and of course we we had a lot of, we had a lot of uh, you know foot dragging from the provincial governments. You know they didn't want to give us any of those rights. You, know, they, you they would make refused. that argument like Clem does that we're constitutional Indians. Is that what you? Oh, no, no, I, I never, never no. use the word. Métis yeah. are recognized. Métis are Métis are Métis. We're Métis, you know, we're a nation. Indians are in the Constitution, yeah. Métis are in the Constitution. Obviously, there has to be a difference in the way you put two names in there. Yeah, but he kind of makes that argument that, you know, like, all that term Indian isn't defined, and you use that, you take a look at all that legislation that's, you know, um, uh, from 1870, um, the Rupert's Land Order, you know, uses the term Aboriginal. I mean, even, you know, we should be, we were included back then in that definition. If you define that term Indian, and even in the BNA Act of uh, 1867, 
uh, the Rieskimo 1939 case where they defined the Inuit as Indian, even though they're not in the, you know, the Indian Act. Therefore, we should yeah, be included. Yeah, of course, he's always, he's always made, he's always made that uh, the you know that, that other argument as well that 90124 would uh, would uh, would address all our concerns. Yeah. And of course, you know, since uh, you know, since the, you know, uh, we, we know that that's that that to be different. Uh, you know, it's not really actually the case. You know, the case is we have inherent rights. You know, we have we rights. Have rights. We have inherent rights as a nation of people. We're Métis. You know, why are we being? You know, uh, uh, why is there a suggestion that we're 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 the same as? You know the, the Indian people. We're not. You know we're we're. It's not know, the suggestion. I don't think he's making that that we're the same as Indian people. It's just yeah, but that, he's making that connection. Though. Yeah, yeah, you he know. is in a way he's that you know that we should be treated not, as as constitution that's not, the that's way they're not right. We have a, we have a duty. We have a, we have we're in the constitution. It is our responsibility now to 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 determine or to yeah. to uh, you know to uh, to definition uh, to, yeah. to define what those rights are. See, and we need to do that at the community level. Yeah. See, you know? my, argument, my argument today when you ask me that question, I don't have to go back in history and explain anymore, justify anymore those things because we're in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. We're there. Yeah. Why am I going to go back and start explaining well, you know, when why you look we're at, there? When you but, look at Grumbo and Polly, though. I mean, they, they are making those arguments. Yeah but, the, yeah, but the point is, again, too, I don't think it's in the Métis' best interest to use the courts. Courts have never worked. And you go into a white man's court, and in terms of the white man's laws, you're going to get a white man's justice. You have, if you're going to go to court as Métis people, they should be clever enough right now to use an international court. Never go to court in this country if you declare yourself a nation. And my argument again is that the treaties are being eroded by many court decisions. Our leaders are not taking responsibility enough by saying, okay, we'll take that to court. You don't take that to court. You never put your treaty up in court. You don't put mm -hmm. your treaty in court. It's no, mm -hmm. You can take an aspect of it or something that flows from it, but never to open up your treaty to go to court. The same thing, the media don't have to open up the whole Constitution again to, to go to They don't need to go to court. They mm -hmm. won the hunting rights. They don't, I'd stay, I told Clem that, stay out of it from now on. You got this. Go to the table and do what you have to do to get your land. Negotiate. Get, you know, Negotiate. get, some, get, get some community and the, backing. And the uh, power's there. But I'll, when they don't ne negotiate with you, what recourse do you have? It who said they're not negotiating with you? Well, I don't know. I'm just you saying know, it just you, seems like nothing you know, happened until now you got Polly. Now, okay then. Yeah, but, you know, but now the, they're going to get yeah, some hunting rights uh, and fishing okay, rights. How do you think I, I, I got the rights? I'm the first guy to break those goddamn rules. I went out into the field after in 1987. I didn't go for my... Bill C-31 at first. Mm -hmm. I said, look, I have the right to hunt and gather. I am an Aboriginal person. I, you know, I could do that, I, you know, whether I'm Métis or Indian. And what they did to me is uh, I got, I, I was charged for hunting uh, on, on, on land that I had permission. Everything was there, and I was charged for hunting game. And uh, I, I said, okay, uh, you know, and, and I said, I have the right to hunt and gather. I said, even though I'm not a treaty Indian, I said, uh, I'm a half-breed, but I can still hunt and gather. And they, they took me to court, and what they did is they spent two years at it, and then finally they start knocking on my door and saying, Jim, why don't you plead guilty to this and we'll drop the other charges? No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to plead guilty to nothing, I have the right. So finally it came down to the point, and they knew I was going to open up the whole, the whole uh, bag of worms. So what they did, the day I went into court, I was due in court in the, after, in the morning, and in the morning before 10 o'clock, Indian Affairs sent a fax or a telegram to the judge, this man is an Indian. He has the right to hunt and gather, a treaty Indian. They even sent the card with it, okay? So he's mm -hmm. a member of this band. He's not a member of the band, but he's a treaty Indian. So when I went to the court, <coughs> I, I wanted to have my say because I thought, well, here's a chance for me to really speak up on behalf of the people again who's, who's getting charged. And the judge said, You're not in my court, you don't. He said. He said, you're finished, get out of here. He said, you got the right to hunt. So, you know, it, it, it again came down to a matter of I was going to stand up, and they threw it out. But I knew that other people would win because we all, that goes partly with the constitutional mm -hmm. rights again. And I told that, I said, you come and hunt with me, any real half-breed mm -hmm. or, or, or Métis like Jim Fable or Jim Droz who wants to come hunt with me in Greenwater Park where I live, I'll take them there, and nobody's going to charge them because I know that they have the right to hunt and fish. But the problem with the Métis at that time, and that again goes back to how the leadership handled the membership cards. 
they gave them out to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, including people who had no Métis history, mm -hmm. no Indian history. This is after Grumble? Uh, this is before. Oh, okay. This is before. This was a few years back. Mm -hmm. And that's why the government stopped everything then. They said, hey, no. And these guys were laughing about it. They were going buying these cards for two, three hundred bucks. Some mm -hmm. of them paid more. And were going out and killing moose and elk and everything and coming out of there and said they had an Indian card. And they were laughing about it because I met these guys were saying, hey, I'm no, no happy. They just bought this and now I can hunt, gather any time I want. And that was a mistake. So again, you 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 got to be serious about your, you know, people don't use that just to go around. And that 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 media membership should mean something, yeah. you know. And and people should really uh, look at that very closely. You don't give it away, sell it to somebody for economic gain, because you're only killing yourself. And that's why they stopped everything. And again, I said one of the reasons that happened is that media have not come up with a definition that's applied mm -hmm. to their people. And until they do that, that's going to that's going to that's going to hurt them. So they they've got to stay out of the courts, go to the table. Because I I thought way back to I think uh, you know when the constitutional talks were over, I thought for a few months after that we had failed. But then when I started looking and saw those Métis rights and the fact that we had constitutional rights and the rights were were protected in Section 35. I said, that's enough. I said, mm -hmm. these guys, we've left them with, with mm -hmm. their recognition. We've left them with, with... But what's really happened, though, since then? I mean... Well, you have to go back well, again to the present yeah, day. And I, I think, think, you know, I think they've lost uh, the support that they had at the community level. You know, I always go back to the community level. And when that happens, what are you going to do? Well, you get pressure and uh, where direction should you go now? And, uh, you know, the easiest thing for them to do, I guess, is go to court. Uh, you know, that's what they've been using. And you don't necessarily need to go there yeah. uh, all the time, no. uh, you know. Especially no. now, uh, no. yeah, we've got some cases that uh, you know that were that we won. Uh, now you should go back to the communities again. You got to go back to the communities and uh, you know and have you know talk about those rights that are in there already. They're there already. When you you think back on the Métis Act, you were instrumental in getting in. Uh, with the government, right? That legislation. Mm -hmm. Is it was it 1999? Uh, yeah, I think there? so. Yeah. How do you feel that that's worked out? Do you have any? Um, well, I didn't. On it? I wasn't very comfortable with the Métis Act to begin with in mm -hmm. the first place. Because I'll tell you what, to me, what 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 has happened, what what it's done, is uh, the Métis Act uh, has has not really recognized. Uh, this Métis Act here in Saskatchewan mm -hmm. really has nothing in it. Nothing in it. It's mm -hmm. got nothing in it. There's absolutely nothing. I, when, when, I, when I first negotiated you know, the Métis Act, I had people like Mark LeClaire helping me out and you know, those, those folks. And I said I wanted to, make, I, I wanted to have land in there. The land was very important. We've got to have land. We've got to have the right to hunt and to fish. Those kind of things needed to be in there. We need to have control of, uh, of our own institutions, uh, education and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. you know? Those are the kind of things that I wanted to see in the Métis Act. Then we've got a, an act just about as good as the one that they have in Alberta, which they've had since the 1940s or whatever it was. The Métis know. Population Betterment Act? Yeah, the, the Métis Betterment Act. Yeah, yeah. because in, in, in Alberta, they have a Métis Betterment Act, which was instituted in the late 30s, early 40s, and they have 1.3 million acres of land mm -hmm. in those five communities. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of land, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, uh, that's what I wanted to see, but... When I saw the act after I left there, uh, you know they, they of course my you know the people that were that were in opposition to me, uh, you know didn't think it was a, you know it's such a great thing and that we mm -hmm. shouldn't we shouldn't be signing anything. So, uh, I, you know I after I, I left there, uh, you know the people that took over went ahead and signed the act without mm -hmm. without having those things in there. You know so all it is actually is a blank blank. Yeah piece of legislation uh, you know there's nothing in there and it says well we this act recognizes the uh, the contributions made by Métis people in mm -hmm. the history of Saskatchewan mm -hmm. big deal but it does I mean, you it, know. it does say that the gov provincial government will enter into negotiations with the Métis with the federal government to secure things like self-government land rights and and dev devolution of programs and so on but do you there's no teeth in it, is that what you're saying? Nothing. That There's nothing in there. All they say is make that statement, you know? I yeah. remember I remember trying to negotiate that thing, and I remember saying I am not going to sign 
an agreement that, uh, that uh, you know, that, that introduces this piece of legislation in this province unless there's teeth in it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's got to have those things. You know, I, I mean, why, why sign a, uh, something that says that they're going to recognize us for our contribution? What the hell does that mean? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, do we, we don't need legislation for that. No. Okay. I wasn't involved in it, but I had a lot of people call me and were not happy with what was going on. Yeah because it didn't even live up to the expectations of what's in the Constitution. And why would you write up something that was still backwards and behind the Constitution that didn't catch up to what's happened? Mm -hmm. You know, if they'd move ahead and say, based on this, we're guaranteed we're going to go down mm -hmm. the road, we're going to, you could go work. That's, and I think this is where the difference between the, the Métis in Saskatchewan and the Métis agreement we got for the Northwest Territories in my last tenure as a, as a national leader for the... Uh, Congress of Aboriginal People a few years back. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just their mind mostly to get them out of debt, but that's all my job was. But at the same time, we, we got an agreement with the Northwest Territories, the Métis, the Northwest Territories in the in the Fort Smith area and the, in that area, and to go through a comprehensive land claim which allows them to deal on every aspect of governance, including including land ownership, including. Uh, uh, governance, including you know, you know, access to the resources, the whole comprehensive claim, and they signed that agreement, and now they're working on that. And at first, they were kind of a little bit leery of it. And I said, guys, you know, do it, uh, do it, because here's something that gives you the same opportunity the Indians are getting in many ways, and gives you the same opportunity to make your claims on your land and then go ahead with the deal. And now I understand it's working well. I had to talk to George mm -hmm. Klazuski the other day, which is part of that. He said, hey, look, we're making progress. We're doing really well on it. Now, why can't that be done with Saskatchewan? Why cannot the Métis in, in Saskatchewan have the same rights in south of, south of 60 as north of 60? Yeah. You know, constitutionally, yeah. you have those yeah. rights. Why are suddenly they getting treated differently up there and then down here you're treated They've differently? They've almost sort of done that up there yeah. with the Northwest so, Territories. So, again, you know, you have... You have allowing Canada to double get away standard. with that double yeah. standard, and yeah. that's what the Métis should be after here. Saying, yeah. "Hey, they got a conference yeah. agreement for the Métis in the Northwest Territories. Let's get an agreement down here in Saskatchewan." Well, you know, when you look back on the Charlottetown Accord with the Meech Lake Accord, no, no, sorry, the the, Char the Métis Nation Accord that was in the in the Charlottetown Accord. Did you, were you involved in that? At all? No, but they Region. didn't include. They didn't put anything in there. It didn't include in the Meech Lake stuff. Accord. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the, in the Const, uh, Charlottetown Accord, they had something called uh, the Métis Nation Accord, which was, if it would have passed in that national referendum, they would have it would have uh, uh, forced the government or, or made a guarantee with the government that they would have implemented self-government. Oh yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I, I suppose. Uh, and I, I and they were going to between there would be a tripartite agreement between uh, the provinces and the federal government and the Métis Nations to p provide them with land and there was something about enumeration and devolution of programs too. And of course when that failed, uh, that went out the window. Yeah, but does that make you go home and sit at home? No. Because that's what no, I said, if we'd no. done the same thing, yeah. nothing would have ever happened. I, I, you can't take that and you know, and I think this is where, again, you go back to the old days of organizing again. When you have trouble like that, you go back to the communities mm -hmm. and you get community support. And when you get community support, you have a hard time to lose. And Northern Saskatchewan is, has been one of the most political awareness people I've ever seen. And they're so frustrated right now when I talk to them, you know, about what to do and how to go about it. And, it, you know, it hurts me because, again, I, I'd like to see these people move on. And I know we're, they're going to get into a lot of arguments when they get into the room, but man, oh man, you know, those kind of discussions can bring out solutions. You know, they don't have to bring out negative things. They can, they can come to some solutions and what they need. And government today has got to get the message because I'll tell you what, you know, it makes me so angry because in Ontario now, they have the Muslims can actually make laws that will be recognized by the Ontario government now to deal with family matters and matters of, uh, of the family and matters including... Uh, many things that terms of not go to the courts, okay? Mm -hmm. Now here's a people that's come over from another country that on religious basis can start making decisions on their own lives in the future much like we want in our constitution. And here we can't do that and we have the constitutional right to do that. 
Yeah. Yet people are bringing their culture from it's another the land, taking it into already. Canada, yeah. and then, yeah. then these people are, are, are saying, okay, we want to enforce these laws, and they're saying, yes, you can do it. So, you know, again, the other thing is, I, I can't understand when you have a, a, a crash like the Air India crash, where 300 and some people get killed, and you have a man who's a millionaire now, who's, you know, who's bringing their war to this country, Canada, instead of leaving it over there where it belongs, and they bring it here and they fight their war here, and when they go out and kill 300 and some people in a terrorist act, and this person's a millionaire, and he's applying for public funding to defend himself, <laughs> and gets it. Now, what, do you, what does that make Canada sound like in terms of helping others? And we're sitting here that belong to this country, and mm -hmm. still our lands, and, and constitutionally, and we're denied that right. So what we need to do, and this is something again that, that I look at, we need to take and teach our children about constitutional rights and about our agenda for constitutional rights and, and how we're going to gain governance and land base, okay? Mm -hmm. Because no one else is going to help us. Mm -hmm. Every new Canadian that comes in is not taught anything about the treaties, mm -hmm. is not taught anything about media rights, so eventually that's not even going to be mentioned. Mm -hmm. So you know who's got to implement that? The Métis themselves. And okay. you cannot go anyplace else for that. You can gain support by doing something that's right. You can gain support, as I told you, if you, if you can show. Uh, you don't really shouldn't have to show it, but you can show that to be economically viable yourselves, you're going to be an asset to Canada rather than the than, than negative, mm -hmm. negative position or being a deficit in this country. You're going to contribute. And without that, Canada is not going to grow. You mm -hmm. cannot always be on the welfare roll. You know, right. you've got to move ahead. And in order to that, you have to have powers. And the Constitution gives you those powers. So it's a matter again of getting out and getting your agenda together, and going back to the communities and working with the communities. Uh, is is that happening in in the land claim? Do you get a sense of that in northwestern Saskatchewan, uh, Jimmy? Where you know people are saying, you know, I know there's research going on in the, on the land claim in the northwest there the homeland, the Métis homeland, uh, and are people doing that there? Are they saying, you know, like this is, to move that agenda forward, we have to know what our what our uh, subsistence lifestyle was and where our rights flow from there, and are, are you involved in any of that at all? Uh, no, not not really. Uh, I am involved in the Primrose Lake Air Weapons Range uh, mm -hmm. situation, but uh, uh, as far as the uh, the land claim is concerned, uh, uh, you know, I don't, uh, you know, my problem with that has always been that uh, people at the community level are not involved enough in it, like to be able mm -hmm. to make intelligent decisions and uh, to be involved in, the, in that thing, because I think any time you make a claim like that, you're doing it uh, hopefully on behalf of uh, those folks that live in that area. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing it on their behalf, then you need to go and tell them what you're doing, and you need to go and tell them what it's all about, where the different stages, where it's at, and uh, you know that sort of thing. So I think that there's there's a, that there is some research happening. I, I, I'm aware of the fact that there is some research happening. I think by uh, Professor Frank Tuff, yes. I think is yeah. doing Clem's that in Edmonton. Yeah, in, in, in Edmonton, University and, uh, of Alberta. Yeah, and uh, and uh, uh, you know that 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 is happening right now, but I don't know how much. Uh, community involvement there is in there, uh, not not very much uh, from what I'm aware of. Uh, you know, I don't think that there's any big meetings happening and giving people information about where things are at right now and what it means and what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, of uh, a case it is. Uh, you know? So people really are unaware of what's going on, is that well, what you're saying? They're not yeah, having I'm, enough input? Yeah, what, what I'm saying is that, you know, there should be a little bit more awareness, I think, than mm -hmm. there is. Uh, workshops you know, held in the communities to get them? Uh, I think there's been a number of workshops, but not and know in a kind of way that they ought to be doing it. Like, you know, I think I think there should be a workshop in every community that's affected, you know, in that whole mm -hmm. northwest side. And I think that there ought to be meetings called, uh, you know, periodically to uh, to have people input. Is there a lot of support for it? Oh, God, for land, yes. Well, for <laughs> land, yeah. You know, there, there's always uh, support for land, but yeah. but people need to understand, uh, you know, what 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 uh, you know what this case is all about. And, and uh, I really don't think that, that they are. That's it. See, I'll tell you one thing that we done years ago, and I don't know if people even mentioned it, and Rosa will remember. When the TLE agreements came out for the Indians... Mm -hmm. Tree land entitlement? Yes, we went, out, we went out to our communities and went to government, and we fought like a bugger. 
to make sure that the Indians could not claim any traditional Métis lands. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's it. what now, you're involved in, Prime Minister. Now, I understand yeah. that that still holds. So that's a sign that government, if they wouldn't give away our lands, then there must, there must be some reason they're not giving away our lands. It still belongs to us. Mm -hmm. So why aren't we following up on that process and saying, okay, these lands are the traditional Métis lands, and they have to belong to us, and we should negotiate on that. Manitoba made a mistake, and I fought with Yvonne Dumont until the, you know, the blue in the face, and that's hard to be, Dorsey, mm -hmm. uh, about the fact when they took the Winnipeg case to court about the lands in Winnipeg belonging to the Métis people. The Dumont case. They yes, they had a good class action suit there against the government and to take for those lands back. Mm -hmm. But then they, they got to the point where the government and the Métis got together in Winnipeg and there was an argument about who should get the land. And it came down now to the last I heard of it, and I got out of it, then I said, I don't support that. Where they were starting to look at each family-owned land there and the history of each family. So mm -hmm. they could start compensating only the families that lived there. Mm -hmm. And I said, that land, because of the Manitoba Act and because of, of the way it was done and the Métis were, you know, you can also say that yeah. Rizal was, was the father of the Manitoba Act in a sense, you mm -hmm. know. He should be remembered for that more than anything else, that these people have the right to lands, and they don't mm -hmm. have to go back and pin it on this individual, get rich, be like a, like a, like a, uh, like a lotto, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like a lotto ticket. They should be able to fight for those lands to be, those lands to belong to the Métis, and any money come to those lands should go back to the Métis. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I even hate the word compensation because compensation is like the end of everything. You get paid off and you go home. I mm -hmm. want to see us included forever in these negotiations, you know. I right. want us to be ever, and that's what self-governance is all about. It's, it's not a one You don't want to give up any rights. Don't give up that's nothing. Right. You, you share just them. keep moving. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's, there's a possibility there, and I still think today, uh, uh, I, I know, I don't know how Derosha feels, but I feel if I was to ever get back to the table with, with the government, federal and provincial, that constitutional section 35 would drive me and others like me and DeRocher to the point where we'd get what we want. We'd get what we want. We know we could do it and how we could do it, and we'd do it. Because it's there already. This is yeah, there already. It's in the Constitution, the highest already, law of the land. Uh, all you got to do is. Forget about what happened prior to that. Yeah, you're an right, Aboriginal yeah. group, you're entitled to these rights. Yeah. That's his. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to justify why I'm there. We're yeah. already there. We're there mm -hmm. in the Constitution. That's as far as we need to go back and explain. We're here. Mm -hmm. And this is what we feel should come from these rights. And that's why I'm saying that the, the, the Métis Act in Saskatchewan is, is really nothing more than just saying the Métis exist. Mm -hmm. Did anything in that act say the province will take any responsibility of initiating anything with the federal government? They'll do nothing. Mm -hmm. They'll do nothing. Mm -hmm. You can't even collect on your, uh, on your Primrose bombing range. You know why? Because Mr. Goodale is saying to, uh, to the Indians, well, I don't want to use the word compensation. It opens the doors for other things. Why not? Christ mm -hmm. Almighty, they have the right. Mm -hmm. Why not? What are you going to call it? You know, why give all that money to the Indians in that territory and all those Métis people who had the traditional hunting grounds for years, suddenly they're not recognized. Mm -hmm. There are people in the Constitution that have recognition. You can't say today they're here and tomorrow, well, we don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, get out and, and deal with them. Yeah. It's just that simple. Could you say a little bit about uh, your work in the Primrose uh Case. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, Primrose was a um, uh, uh, developed, uh, I guess, it was instituted all oh, back in the 1950s, I guess, 51, 52, 53, or something to that effect, where the federal government made a, uh, uh, a deal with the provincial government. And here again is a classic example of Aboriginal people not being involved. Nobody in, that, in those communities, like Kino Lake First Nations, mm -hmm. uh, Cold Bay, Johns Bay, Beauval, Isla Cross, nobody was included, was asked whether they, they, you know, they wanted to. The federal government approached the province and said, hey, we want this piece of land. They marked it off and, and said, we want to use it for, you know, for, uh, you know, for uh, air weapons range. We want to test our air weapons. And uh, the province uh, signed on the dotted line. They said, sure, you can have it for, you know, I forget, $250,000 a year. That's what they've been getting. Two hundred mm -hmm. started out at two hundred thousand, and every seven years they are able to renegotiate that, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's up to about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year is what the province gets for that use of that land. And uh, but what happened was after they signed, 
the first thing that happened is the conservation officers went in there, Department of National Defense guys went in there, and they started kicking out these guys, you know. They, they say, hey, you can't live here anymore. We're going to use this as an air weapons range. And they kicked out all of these people that used to make a living that were living on their, mm -hmm. uh, you know, old George Le Riviere and, uh, and uh, you know, Louis Roy and, uh, uh, you know, McCollum and, uh, uh, you know, Aubuchon and all these guys. They were all kicked out of there. There's a couple of liberties there, for example. And uh, uh, they kicked them all out and told them, you can't come here anymore. And so what did that happen? What, 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 what did that cause? It caused a tremendous uh, amount of problems for the surrounding communities because these other communities, like Isla Cross, Cold Bay, Johns Bay, Beauvel, uh, had, had uh, their own trap lines, for example. Eh? And so these folks that are kicked out of there had to move someplace to follow their traditional way mm -hmm. of life. So they tried to go into places like Beauvel or Isla Cross. There was no room for them. And so that caused, you know, from further hardships and further uh, problems for them. And, uh, and uh, uh, Lawrence Yu, he was another, there's another leader who passed away a few years ago. He decided at that point in time that he wanted to, uh, he wanted to uh, do something about this. And so under the municipal, uh, Northern Municipal Council, yep. he, he said, hey, listen, you know, we want, we, want, we, yeah, we want to help these folks. We, we, we think that they should be... You know, there should be some form of compensation, some form of recognition, because they were kicked off that bombing range. Mm -hmm. They had no choice in the matter but to move. And, uh, and uh, so he organized, he organized folks around there. And then I came in very, very late on the, in, the, in the picture trying to help, uh, you know, get the federal government to the table to start negotiating, because we didn't want to go to court. Uh, on the issue, because you go to court, it's going to take you 10 yeah. years. By that time, Christ, you know, half of your people are going to are dying right. off. And, mm -hmm. and as it is, we're having a, we don't have that many people left that were actually, uh, you know, that were actually affected, you know, personally affected. We have a lot of, uh, you know, they're... They did they're, compensate First Nations people. Well, that's exactly, that's exactly what they did. See, they, they compensated the First Nations people. They compensated the Alberta side. And they got $15 million in Alberta. And they got $13 million, uh, Canoe Lake First Nations. Mm -hmm. And they did not call it compensation, like Sinclair was saying, they have a problem with that word compensation. So I said, well, I don't care what you call it. I said, you know, it's, uh, you, know you still have to recognize the fact that, may, may, that uh, you know, Aboriginal people were kicked off that bombing range. We congratulated them on uh, giving the First Nations people their money. And uh, we said, now, what are you going to do with the Métis? Uh, and they would not, they, they still have not, and uh, they, they're, you know, pussyfooting around, and uh, that's where things are at right now. So, uh, Ralph Goodale was there four years ago, three and a half years ago, Ralph Goodale was there. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he said, uh, you know, hey, I want to resolve this issue within one year. Well, that's three and a half years ago. Ralph has not resolved the issue. And we're saying now, well, let's do something. Let's, let's you know, figure something out here. Mm -hmm. And so, where is it at now? Well, where it's at right now is we're waiting. Uh, we're waiting for uh, for uh, uh, Ralph uh, Goodale. Uh, we've written him a letter here uh, just very recently, and we've written a letter to Anne McClellan as well. I had a meeting with Anne McClellan last week, uh, asking asking for uh, asking for her to to tell the Department of National Defense to get back to the table so that we can continue negotiating for this thing. And, uh, you know, I've asked Jim, Jim as well and his connections with uh, Ralph Goodale to, to get Ralph Goodale to f fulfill his commitment, uh, you know, uh, on, on, on that issue. It's not really that, that difficult an issue because I've told Ralph Goodale, I said, Ralph, I said, you've dealt with the First Nations people on this issue. They're fairly happy with the way that you've handled this thing. Uh, all you have to do is deal with the Métis in the same manner, I said. And if you're afraid of the word compensation, the people over there don't really care what okay. you call it. You know, they don't mm -hmm. care. Uh, so mm -hmm. Call it honor payment, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, uh, you know, he hasn't, uh, he hasn't really, you know, come across with anything. Are you optimistic that something will come across? Well, uh, I'm optimistic in the, way, in the in 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 the sense that you know I got you know uh, you know Jim and uh, and I got the you know the deputy prime minister now Anne McClellan. I met with her last week, like I said on that issue, and uh, she's going to be talking to, with Ralph again, and she's going to be talking with Denny Kader, who's the minister responsible for MET, and she and he's, she's also going to be talking to uh, Pratt, uh, David Pratt, who's the minister of national defense. Mm -hmm 
to try and get back to the table again and try and deal with this issue. Mm -hmm. So that's where things are at at this very moment, and I'm just waiting for a word from from somebody. And I, uh, you know, uh, I, I've been getting a lot of heat from the people in the north to take it to the press and go go go. Let's let's take it to the press and start putting a little bit of heat on these guys. And yeah. uh, I'm just giving them a little more time to you know hope that Jim can mm -hmm. talk to. A, well, know. it's unconscionable that they would compensate one group and not the yeah, other. Yeah, exactly. I just, I did, to me, well, it's I asked them. I, I asked them about that. Sense. I said, "How come you're able to do that for the First Nations people and you're not able to do anything for us?" I said, and they, and uh, their answer was uh, the PCO's answer was, uh, uh, "Well, they have a process in place. You know, they have the comprehensive land claim process in place." And so I said, "Well, if that's all it takes, give us a process. Yeah. What the hell's a big deal? Yeah. You know." Hmm. Nothing has happened. Well, interesting. Absolutely. Uh, there's a couple of other things I just wanted to get your uh, thoughts on. Uh, first of all, um, when you think back on your political careers, what do you think you're, you know, what are you most proud of when you think back on, on what you've done for your people? Well, if I can start, I guess uh, one of the, the things that I'm very proud of uh, is the fact that that uh, you know, Métis people were f uh, finally woke up from from whatever they were in. Uh, you know, when they they finally had an understanding that they had rights. They have an understanding that 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 they can do things if they do it collectively. If and you know, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that they were able to see. You know, with uh, you know, people helping them see where the problems are you know for example the churches churches not always have not always been our friends and uh, the RCMP and uh, you know the social workers and those kind of things I'm very proud of those those things that they were finally able to wake up to and uh, and and try to do something for themselves and help themselves and that's that, that's precisely what they did and I'm very proud of the fact as well that, uh, you know, with leaders like Jim Sinclair who made sure that the Constitution, that the Métis were involved in the Constitution, included in the Constitution. Very proud of the fact that we try to simplify the Constitution, that it should not be a document that only lawyers can read. Mm -hmm. It should be a people's document. It's a living document and it's a working document that anybody can look at and say, okay, what are my rights? Well, here they are, bang. Section 35, very clear identifies me as a Métis and these are my rights. Right. That's the kind of document it should be. Uh, otherwise, if it starts getting too complicated, then we start getting into a lot of problems where only the lawyers are going to be dealing with the constitutional matters, you know? And these are our rights as, as people at the, at the community level. So I'm very proud of that fact. I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, that, uh, that uh, you know, people have finally woke up in that you know the powers that be have you know now know that they can't just trample all over Aboriginal people and they were not without you know without Aboriginal people. People no longer have to sign on the dotted line with an X. Mm -hmm. You know, people people like mm -hmm. yourself, Ron. Mm -hmm. You know, you're educated, you're an mm -hmm. academic, and you're you know you know you know about constitutional matters. You know about those kind of things and. Uh, there are a lot of our young people now that are going to universities and going to school. You know, they got a lot, a lot of chances. Things that Sinclair and I could only dream of, you know. Right. And, uh, and I'm so proud of that. I'm just so happy that Métis people are able to at least get out and try to do something and identify and recognize and mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, I, think, I think just to add to what Jimmy said, I think the, 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 there's where you people have responsibility because, again, you know, even if in the courts or in your position about your rights and how you exercise your rights, oral history is now accepted. Mm -hmm. You know, so you get a history from people like us and others. You can use that when you're in your in your arguments for mm -hmm. land and for rights, because it's accepted in in, in Canada. That, that's part of our oral history is, is you know is is testimony, and you can use it. That's important. But I think if you go back and you ask me the same question about, mm -hmm. uh, I think the greatest achievement in, in my days, you know, when I look back, is, is the, the people I worked with, you know, again, the communities I worked with and the communities I was involved with, is to me uh, so important to get to know the people I did, 
and to work with the people I did. And uh, that to me is, is gratifying because I have never been accepted by either federal or provincial government as, as something as, as they would look that they'd want to bring on the inside. They still want to keep me outside. And to me, that's a badge of honor. You know, I look at it that way because I think it's more important for me to be looked at in that manner than I would to be honored all the time by the white man. If any honors comes to me, it, it usually comes from my own people for what I did. And I think that the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the people that, that we worked with again, you know, uh, has, has, made, has made my life a whole, a whole difference in my life because of what these people did. And I, I seen how hard they worked, how hard they struggled. And some people died for our cause and went to prison for our cause and, uh, you know, and died with alcoholism even that were drinking from, from working with us, but nevertheless still had the goals in mind. And like I said, they never wavered from our rights. And those people I have a lot of respect for. And I think that, again, uh, you know, uh, it led us into, into things in our life that we can all take credit for. And the constitutional process is one of them, you know. We all can take credit for that. There's no one that has to say, I didn't participate. Uh, the the Batoche, the 20,000 people that came to Batoche, and if you look at those 20,000 people that came, some of them brought their families, some of their families stayed at home. Just supposing those people were related to 10 others, that makes 200,000, you know. So we've had, we've had people where people have showed us the fact that they are not going to lay down and die because someone said at one time they didn't exist or at some time they had to find their identity with another race of people. And I think that to me is something that, that, that I'll never forget. And it, it, it sort of justified the day that I walked into the employment office and I said I was an Indian and they said no. And I said it was a half-breed and they said no. And I was proclaimed a Scotchman. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, to me, is, is, is it, it, it fixes all of that. It, it's changed mm -hmm. that. It, it's, 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 I'm a person now, and mm -hmm. I, I don't have to be. I, I can go where I belong. I can be part of the, the, the half-breed world. I can be part of the Indian world, and that's, that's a good part of it. I, I can have dual citizenship, if you want to call that. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's, that's good for me, and I think, I think, again, that those people that struggled, I have so much respect for it. I, I, the, my only wish is that I would see more a more of a build up with the people who provided that leadership in their communities more of I'd like to see to be honest with you a statue or a stone to people like like Robbie Fontaine you know uh, people like Napoleon Fontaine I go and visit his grave all the time back in Lestock and I just say to myself Nap you know you didn't die for nothing you know and I think that uh, these people again you know have, have done so have given so much and given their whole life for that. And, uh, you know, and some of them felt they failed. They didn't fail. They didn't fail. We uh -huh. didn't fail. I think that, that our work is more and more as we move on into history. I think, and, and the more I look that we didn't fail, and it's maybe it's a bad way to look at it, but I'm blaming our own leadership today more than I blame government or anybody else for things not happening because they're not moving on these issues. They're, they're, they're falling into service programs, and I blame the Indians for the same thing. They, they've got themselves, in, in a sense, where they got themselves into a position where they, they forgot about their treaties, and they're now, they're now program-oriented, or going in and signing agreements that uh, it doesn't derogate or abrogate or abrogate the rights. You've heard that so many times. Uh -huh. You know, it just kills when I hear that kind of words. And I think the Métis are into the same thing. The Métis have to have their political arm and the arm for the services. And the service arm should be in the communities, handled by boards. The political arm should be people that come from the communities and that move ahead the political agenda, which will provide the services to the people. So is that, is that what you'd like to see in the future then? That's is what I'd like to see in the future. I'd like to see those, those communities begin to be involved. I want to see them be involved in land claims. I want to see them be involved in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, 
of defining the rights and exercising the rights and implementation of the rights. Mm -hmm. You, Jimmy, what do you see for the yeah. future? What would you like to see for you? Yeah, basically the same thing. I, you know, I would like to see the implementation of those rights that are there already. Mm -hmm. You know, let's let's uh, let's convince our leaders to uh, you know to, to go to, those, to take ownership of those rights. You know, we uh, they're there already. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is we need to go back to the communities. We need to convince uh, you know the communities that we're you know we're we're we're, we're going to we're going to go and get, get our rights and exercise those rights and uh, take ownership of them. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to do. And uh, and I also hope uh, very sincerely that you know some of our young people uh, you know for example that are going to university, going to school, and that sort of thing. Uh, you know I, I hope that many more uh, will go will 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 do that. But but uh, you know let's not forget our traditional. You know our traditions, our traditional way of life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know we need to, we need to keep keep that. Otherwise, we're all going to become, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're never going to change. Yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but but hopefully that'll happen. You know, mm -hmm. hopefully that'll happen with our young people. And uh, you know, I'm hoping that it'll be a little bit easier for them than it was for us. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully, hopefully we've opened those doors. Oh, well, certainly, both of your work has made it a lot easier for many of us. So that's about basically what yeah. you know what I. Wish. Mm -hmm. what, would you like to add anything before we, uh, anything else that you'd like to say uh, on any issue at all? Well, you know, I don't want to blame, you know, it's, it's easy to put blame on the people because we've had our share of, of, of failures as well. But I think, you know, there has to be a fundamental change in the Medi constitution now to make things different, to, to, to set to set the record straight and to give the opportunities, more opportunities to people at the community level. Because if you stop and look at it, as a result of your of your constitutional rights and Canada's constitution, your own constitution should be built around the rights that you see for your people in accordance with what Canada recognizes you too. So you got the full recognition. Build a constitution that builds your people around those rights and those institutions. And uh, you know, and and build the communities. I think that's that can, that can be done. But you're going to have to change that constitution, as Drosher and I were saying. You have to. The political leaders are going to have to take on the responsibility, not the Senate. You know, and I, mm -hmm. I, I think it it might have been a nice way to do things to respect your elders. But you know, right now you don't want you you got the leadership must take the responsibility. They can't blame the Senate. You have to take the full responsibility of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You have to be inclusive. You have to, for God's sakes, don't leave out people who might have voted the wrong way or you kick a whole community out or a whole local out. Mm -hmm. You've got to somehow be inclusive because it's dividing your people. Again, you know, uh, again, let's not get too, uh, you know, I, 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 this is what people tell me, again, that they're saying that the Red River people again. If you're going to base on the Red River people, I'm left out. Mm -hmm. If you're going to base mm -hmm. on another group, I'm left out. God sakes, let's let's get these people together and, and just know what our issues are and our problems are, and our identity should be mm -hmm. should be based on on our on our on our on the issues that we have. You know, we we all face the same issues, and I think that you know that building our nation is is really really important this time, and you have an opportunity to to build in Western Canada here. You have an opportunity to to sit down with the Prime Minister right now today, and this is this is something I worked very hard on over the last year, is to get that Prime Minister set up a special a special executive uh, uh, committee in Ottawa to, to uh, I think he has 14 ministers on it now, to deal specifically with the rights of Aboriginal peoples, to deal with treaties, to deal with Métis rights, to be able to start implementing these rights and, and you know, put them into action. And if, if that's followed up, it can happen. But again, you, 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 you must go there and you must have a platform and you must be able to implement that agenda. And I think again, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not going to be easy, but I, I think the leaders have a real job before them, but, but they're just at that point in history now where, where I say, they're, they're better off than the Indians because the Indians have treaties that they haven't been implementing for so long and they sort of left them in the background. The Métis have a newly in the Constitution and they can take a look at that say and say, hey, look, 
we got everything. We got a full box of rights here. You know, it's what are we going to take out? What are we going to implement mm -hmm. first? And they can do it on that basis, where it's not spelled out for them what they can and they can't do. Mm -hmm. And I think again, the provinces, uh, you know, they have to be tough with the province. You got to go to the table and say, this is what we want, and this is how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I can't have a premier come along and say, well, I'll give you a few bucks, go home and do this, or I'll give you a few bucks. You know, those days are gone. And for even a place like the Primrose bombing range, where you have uh, Jimmy and a, a few people trying to fight for this, where's the leadership on this in terms of getting and supporting these people? You know, these are fundamental issues. And, and never worry about whether they're going to cut off your budget or not, because <laughs> we never worried about it. Do it. Do what has to be done. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to put your rights in the terms of dollar and cents, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. You're in trouble, and you know, and, and your people are in trouble because you're going to have you're going to have again uh, another what I call I, I could call a banana republic, or I could call a, a you know a, a third world nation where you don't have no working class and you have an upper class and you have the poor. The Métis nation's only going to survive if it gets a working class, and that working class will support the social structures. Mm -hmm and also support your tax base and whatever you need to do things in your community where you're doing things on your own as well. And then your agreements with the land and resources will give you a contribution to your people and also a contribution to Canada. This pipeline, for instance, that's coming down from northern, uh, from across the, the north and territories, you know, we should be involved in this, con this construction. We should be involved in, in the business of that. We want to be um, um, not just employees, we want to be employers. We want to be employers. We want to be on the upstream yeah. of economic development, yeah. which means mm -hmm. ownership. We can be there. We can be mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And, I, I, and Canada is such a, a huge opportunity for that. And I, I think this this whole business of, of, of this terrorism that's came around and and, you know, and and it's taken over everybody's agenda and over everybody's life. Suddenly, the federal government's found out we're not the enemy. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, that Oka was Oka. I predicted Oka. I said this is going to happen. I said you walk away from the stable. This is going to happen, and it happened uh, very shortly after that. And Oka was a, an internal struggle over our rights within this country that people were prepared, still prepared to go to the table. But you have somebody from another country blowing up Canada. Then what are you going to do about it? Go mm -hmm. bomb the other country? Mm -hmm. So you can work out your solutions at home. Mm -hmm. You you have a, a home problems, home solutions, mm -hmm. and. That's not a hard thing to, to look at and to solve. And in a country as rich as this, there's no need to have our children dying on the streets, overdose of drugs, no reason to have our children dying of the suicides we they, they have, no reason to have our people living in slum houses and pushed around and, and you know and uh, living under the poor conditions that they have to live under. And I started out 45 years ago feeding people. I'm 45 years later, later feeding people again. So I've made full circle. And I don't want to feed my people. Uh, you know, I think the old saying goes well yet today as it did in that time. You feed people, uh, you know, a, a fish every day, then you're going to feed them forever. You teach them how to fish and they can feed themselves. And I think that's the same way it applies to us. We'll teach our people to do things, and we have the people that will do it as long as we can get in the door, get our foot in the door. So we have a job ahead of us. And uh, I think it's going to take not just one leader, it's going to take uh, many leaders. But then again, the big question is, I think, Jimmy, is, is who's going to lead the way? You know, who's going to lead the way? Is it BC? Is it Alberta? Is it Saskatchewan? Is it Ontario? Who's going to, who's going to be the leaders that come up with some of these solutions that everybody will catch on to and start moving again? And until you do that, you're you're going to be left with service programs and uh, letters of, no, I won't do this, but I'll give you this. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, So I want to see that in the future for our people. And uh, I'll help till my dying day as long as people are working towards the rights of our people. The rights of our people are so important to me. That's all I want to work for. And some people still think I'm a radical when I go up and say, let's exercise our treaty rights. Let's exercise these rights. People say, oh, geez, that's too radical. We can't do that. Well, God damn it, you know, Canadians live by a constitution. 
why can't we live by a constitution we developed that clearly recognizes our rights? And we're doing the right thing, you know. Mm -hmm. We have our people, uh, our argument in those days, Jimmy, is we have our people in jail for being drunk, we have our people in jail for drunk driving, we have our people in for several things. Why not go to jail for political reasons, for demonstrations and occupations? And I'll mm -hmm. tell you, once we start doing that, very damn few people ever went to jail. They didn't want to make martyrs out of any of us. They were careful about that. Mm -hmm. And that's what really kept our movement going. And, and governments listened, started to listen, because we were organized. And organize, organize, organize. You know, you go out and you talk to people. You can't, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. That's still my argument. And your institute that you have right now, by doing a history of, of the past and bringing that history to life, you can help. You can help because you can educate people, uh, the young people of today, for tomorrow. And you can do that without political interference because no one's going to stop you from doing that kind of thing. And even your own Dumont Institute can have open forums, political forums, where you bring your students together and people together and bring in old people like myself and others and people with different views to talk about things. And you build and you'll find your children will learn a lot before they get into the real world again. Let's teach them what's really out there and how they can go about exercising their rights. And then again, never, to get the his never forget the history. Now, I'll keep saying this over and over again as long as I live, is that no one person in our day, in the 20 some years I was with the Maiti people, has, has, has been responsible for leading the movement. We all were there. We all were there. And my role is only to be a spokesperson. That role would have never happened without the support of the people. If people didn't get out and work, never, never would have happened. Like, if Derosha didn't go to work and help me, you know, and politicized people and others didn't go there, nothing would have happened. So, you know, you can't say, Sinclair done this, Sinclair done that. The guys in the background should get more credit than I, because they did the work, and they did the work without ever getting any real honors for it. That's important. Very well spoken. Is there anything you'd like to uh, say that you know we never discussed here that you would like to? Uh, well, n not not that we haven't discussed here yet, but I just want to emphasize, re-emphasize again. Uh, you know those those people that have passed on. Uh, you know, like old Vital Morn and uh, mm -hmm. you know Louis and. Uh, and Robbie Fontaine from Laloche and uh, Pierre Carrier from Cumberland House, mm -hmm. Bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and old Jacob Morris from Beauvel, mm -hmm. Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. You know, another another good organizer that helped us out lots. And uh, there's so many of them. And uh, you know, so, uh, you know, a lot of the ladies. You know, that unspoken. You know, and uh, unheard of. And uh, but that were there in the background and did all the work that needed to be done. You know, to get get people together. You know, I really, you know, think about them a lot, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I really, you know, uh, well, sometimes I even pray for them, you know, just because they've, they've passed on now and they, you know, they, they deserve to be, to be recognized. They deserve to be, you know, uh, they deserve a plaque or they deserve a statue and they deserve something, some kind of recognition. And I'm hoping that the young people that are, you know, coming on now will, will remember those those folks because a lot of them were their grandparents and their mothers and their dads and you know that that sort of thing and uh, we need we need to always remember them because if you're a nation of people you know you've got to remember that you you've got to remember your past you've got to remember your history and that's part of the history that you know that needs to be to be remembered and uh, remember old Nap Nap uh, Lafontaine you know and uh, uh, you know the Dijerle boys, Tom Dijerle and oh, those yeah. guys. You know, and uh, you know they worked hard, and uh, and uh, you know Jim Parisian. You know yeah. some of mm -hmm. those folks that are not no longer with us. Bill Daniels. Yeah, Bill you know Daniels. Bill Daniels, and uh, there's another guy, uh, Nielsen, Don uh, Nielsen, old yeah. Don Nielsen. Yeah, he passed on a few mm -hmm. years ago. He was an educator, helped us out lots, and really believed in Métis cause and you know Métis and Métisism and. Uh, People like old Jack Favel, you know, that would walk for yeah. 20 miles just to come to a meeting before, with us, you know, <laughs> and really dedicated and understood those kind of things. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to remember those folks. And, you know, without them, you know, like Sinclair said, that we were just, you know, all we did was... We wouldn't be here. Yeah, we wouldn't be here, yeah. yeah. We wouldn't have the kind of things that are constitutionally ours now, mm -hmm. you know. They're there. All we have to do is get to work and 
you know, let's, mm -hmm. let's do them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, poverty was, you know, poverty was our motivation, I suppose. Uh, you know, I think if you, when you look back, those road launches uh, were really a place where people can remember, you know, they had happy times, but it was a place where we were victims of a system that we didn't exist and no one would recognize our existence. And that, that is, again, a, you know, really bad for Canada. In fact, if the Métis want to go to court, and I said that to them before, if you want to go to court, the Japanese took Canada to task for their internment, internment and the Chinese for, for being slaves on the railroad. Uh, you know, there's been other action suits taken in Canada where Canada has given apologies. Shouldn't Canada look at compensation for the Métis who didn't get an education, who some of them are still alive today who can't read and write, uh, were victims because simply because they said they didn't pay taxes and didn't have the right to go to a school, mm -hmm. uh, didn't have a right to have a house, didn't have a right to, to you know, to many things that Canadians take for, for, for granted. That's the kind of suit I would go to court with. And, and you know, you, even if you didn't win, it would bring out the history again mm -hmm. of the Métis and the poverty mm -hmm. they faced and the discrimination and the racism they faced. And that's made so many of us angry over the years and, and made people like me angry, you know. And, and, uh, and that anger, you know, you'll never, never forget. And I think it's really important because, as I said before, I have the heroes that I have, the best in my mind, I suppose, are, like I said, is Gabriel Dumont. I've had great respect for Geronimo because when I read the history of what he done and how he done it when he fought the whole United States Army because he didn't want to be put in a reservation, you really understand what life was about for our people and our whole existence. And that when he was finally captured, he was put into a, a uh, environment, I think they finally took him to Oklahoma where he had to stay on a reservation where he sold pencils, I think, you know, and, and signed autographs. But they told the people not to recognize him, that he was he was sort of not recognized because he was, uh, you know, they should not take away the history from him. Mm -hmm. And people <coughs> who was forced to come into mm -hmm. Canada and then, you know, fought his battle of the Little Bighorn and those places and were left out of out of history when they did have a big impact on history and that history actually uh, had would have had bad results for us because you know they thought indians in those days were not smart those indians in those days knew that custer wanted to become president of the united states and the way he was going to be president of the united states was to fight the last indian war and beat the indians and mm -hmm. he would become president and kill off the rest they knew that and they gathered there and they've done the opposite. They killed him so he'd never become president. And that had a change in history. Now again, when Sitting Bull came to Canada, of course, he stayed here for some time before he went back. But when he went back, he was shot by two deputies, his own people who were deputized as policemen. So again, it's a system that turned his own people against him. You know, and, and so I feel honored right now when I said when government, in a sense, uh, doesn't like me or, or keeps me on the outside because it's almost fitting that, that, you know, because of what I did, would keep me in that arm's length from government, you know. So for me, that's, a, like I said, a badge of honor. And although I'll never fill the shoes those guys did, I can understand what they went through. And people like Gabriel Dumont, who, who you know, who took the struggle and was willing to die for it, and, and, you know, basically set the standard for the half-breeds in terms of their courage mm -hmm. and what they could do. And when you start thinking again about the soldiers, I was just thinking the other day, my uncle Douglas died overseas on April 11th in 1943, was killed in Italy. And uh, we, we had all these people, and, and when Van der Zam was sitting there, and, you know, I told him very clearly that time, and I still remember telling him, you came over to Canada and in nine years of coming to Canada, you become premier. And you sit there and you deny us our rights when our people liberated your people in Holland. I remember that. So, 
you know, it, it's a sense of, of, of again, of, of how our people, you know, sacrificed so much and went through so much to live in this country and to be treated the way they were treated. And I think, again, that, you know, uh, after that meeting, uh, I didn't tell you, but uh, Van der Zam invited me to meet him in Victoria for two hours. He sat and talked to me about that meeting and tried to somehow apologize for what he said and said that I didn't know that, Jim. I should have known better than to say that. And he said, you singled me out. He said, and that oh, I'm embarrassed over that and I'll never forget that. So he mm. was, in a, in, a, in a sense, apologized. We weren't looking for an apology. We were looking for an agreement. But <coughs> nevertheless, you know, that was said divine. He deserved what he got. And to this day, I still say he deserved what he got, you know. But at the same time, Divine was, you know, was one guy that was actually willing to give us some help in terms of getting us mm. some land. Mm -hmm. And he should have said it there. He should have been the hero there and said it. He would have been, uh, it would have <laughs> changed from <it> zero <laughs> to a hero. But he could have helped us at that time at the Constitutional Conference, but he, his people told him to back off, even though people like Sid Duchek said, look, you should go along with this. It's worthwhile. But Gary Lane hates Indians, you know, so he's going to hate us. And there was an argument. I know they had a discussion. I was told clearly after they had a discussion that is Sinclair going to raise hell with us or is he going to go home and keep his money? And the bet was by Divine was he's going to not say nothing and keep his money. And Duchek said, no, he's going to nail us. Uh, Duchek was right. Duchek was right. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm.